Welcome back to the Name Redacted Podcast, America's most beloved podcast, the most downloaded Red Sox podcast in the world. And today, because yeah, I, I want to feel positive, I want to feel enlightened, I want to feel educated, I needed to feel motivated. There's one man, one man on planet Earth whose number I could punch into my phone, call up and say, hey, we need you on the podcast. We need to see the light. That man is Lou Merloni, who, by the way, I, I one thing about me, Lou, and I don't know if you because yeah. I, I, I didn't do a lot about this on the baseball show. Uh, I like to make a lot of wrestling references. It's kind of just it's okay. my thing. But so I'm going to make a wrestling reference here with Lou Merloni. Lou Merloni is essentially the Chris Jericho of uh, Boston sports media because he had this and still is still is going lengthy career where he reinvents himself all the time. And, ev- and so he'll do something and it's like, this is awesome. Everyone knows him for this. And then he'll do something else. Be like, This is awesome. And now this is over. And then he'll just reinvent himself again. That's you. Like right now, this version of Loomer Loney is my favorite Loomer. And I love all <laughs> versions of, I loved baseball player Loomer Loney. I love fucking sports radio yeah. talk Loomer Loney. Obviously, a personal favorite of mine, baseball show Lou Merloni was uh, near and dear to my heart. But yeah. dog walk Twitter video Lou Merloni, that's yeah. this is outstanding. And on top of that, we're about to get Nesson Booth Red Sox broadcast on television Lou Merloni. I still don't know which one's my favorite, but right now I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of Twitter dog walk Lou Merloni. <laughs> I wish I could admit and tell you that I knew Chris Jericho's career, but I don't. So I don't even know what the freak the reference means, but I mm-hmm. appreciate it. I Listen, the beauty of it is it's just baseball. It's just I baseball. woke up today and someone's like, who are the Celtics going to trade for? I said, I don't give a rat's ass. I really <laughs> don't. I don't care if Brady and Belichick are on some podcast together. What I care about are the rule changes. What I care about are the depth of the Red Sox in AAA, in the middle of the infield, the bullpen, the rotation, the lineup. That's all I got to care about. And it is like a happy me, a happy me until about, you know, we'll see Memorial Day. If this team is losing, maybe angry Lou might come out. We'll see. It's happy. Thank you, Lou. Please. Thank, Thank you, I mean, you Lou. You know, Thank I mean, you. this is, you this deserve is it. who I am. I'm going to now Google Chris Jericho. <laughs> <laughs> you deserve it. I, I mean, I've... Uh, I was I've been following your career since before we uh, or at least I had the privilege of working with you on the baseball Mm -hmm. show. Uh, I think, you know, and I never really got to tell you this, but working with you on the baseball show is is what kind of got me out of my shell. People people will go back and say, uh, because I I posted a video last week of of me, my YouTube channel from 2011, I think it was like, when did you drop your accent? How did you drop your accent? I was like, because I started doing TV with Lou. I sounded like an asshole. So I just made a conscious effort to not sound like that anymore. And when I started doing stuff outside of like when you're a blogger, you're, you know, bloggers. I mean, blogger is a more encompassing term these days. But back then, being a blogger meant that you just wrote blogs. You would just hide behind the computer and you would write blogs. When I started doing TV with you, it was like, uh, this is a different form of media. This is, uh, you have to be, but we were wearing suits back then. You have to be buttoned oh, yeah. up quite literally. But so we, it would be you, me, McAdam, Numi, RIP, mm-hmm. a legend in this game. Uh, but then when we would do our segment, we would go into whatever studio, ABC, whatever the fuck it was. Uh, and it was just me and you. That's yeah. when it, I was having fun. That's when it was like, yeah. all right, baseball can be fun. You should be enjoying this. It shouldn't just be about the numbers. No offense, Tyler. Uh, it, it baseball. <laughs> that's when the 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 Clay Buckholtz stuff happened. The Pablo Sandoval rants happened, and we obviously had Drellick, which I want to hit on that by the way, because he yes. hasn't spoken to me in fucking two years. When's the last time you talked to Evan Drellick? Uh, actually, I got a text from him the other day, a little text back and forth, but I haven't talked mm-hmm. to him in a while. That was my guy. Now, obviously, he's involved, right, into some other things. He's got a little book coming out, which I'm sure you want to get to. Yeah, he's but, got a book uh, coming out. Yeah, he's right in the middle of it. He's made a few enemies of people that we might know. I'm one of them. You hate I'll, him. That's it. It's I'll, over. I'll, he's dead I'll choke you? the motherfucker out. I told you. he. So he used to be a, a recurring guest on this podcast where yeah. – if they were, he was our designated beat writer. But I mean, he's not on the Red Sox beat anymore. But this was right when this story broke, and um, I would call him up, and and then he he ducked us that one time, and then I ended up seeing him 
at the winter meetings in San Diego. That must have been 2020. It was when when Gary mm-hmm. Cole signed with the Yankees. So I think it was 2020. Uh, and he was like, oh, you know, like, sorry, I just didn't see him. No. And I haven't I haven't seen him since. I haven't spoken to him since. And I people forget. Used to do TV with Drellick. Me, Lou, well, and Drellick say, were the baseball show. I would say, you know, if he's, if he's dogging you like that, then that's one thing. For me, it's like, I like Evan. Do I agree with where he's going? Do I, can I poke some holes in maybe a few things that he's talked about here recently? Sure. But I do respect the guy. He doesn't, he's not out to make friends. He's doing his job. Uh, did it piss off some people around here and some people that we know? Of course it did, but I still like him. I, I still like, like him too. Guy. That's the thing. Like, I would guy. love to hear from him. I think that he thinks that I genuinely I hate him. Set it up. Let's I let, set it up. Can I bring you two together? It's it's Is totally there like on a him. Wrestling reference you can give me, like that someone can come here and bring two guys together. It's like it's like Shawn Michaels and Bret Hart, the Montreal Thank screw you. job. It's like it it didn't it, it was business. Business was business. You can still like each other as people, but business gets in the way sometimes. And then you end up 20 years down the road and you haven't spoken words to each other. And someone has to put their feelings aside. Someone has to apologize. I certainly am not going to apologize there. I'm not going to name names, but there is a very prominent baseball journalist that told me that I should apologize to Evan because I was unfair to him. Fuck you. I was not unfair to Evan. I just, all I said, and, and you can agree or disagree with this, Lou. Yeah, Here's what I yeah, said about good. this. Good. Evan Drellick worked in Houston, had a grudge yeah. against Jim Crane. He worked yeah. in Boston, had a grudge yeah. against Dave Dombrowski. And then that story came out. The Astros were cheaters. The Red Sox were cheaters. And it was Evan Drellick and Ken Rosenthal who put the story out there. And I said, if Evan Drellick worked in Los Angeles and Chicago, no it's the Cubs and the Dodgers that were the cheaters. It was, mm-hmm. it was just where he had sources because he worked in those markets. And that's all I said. I said he had a personal ax to grind against Jim Crane and Dave Dombrowski. And that was the crux of this cheating scandal coming to light. And maybe... I will say I mean, the Houston Astros level of cheating was was higher than maybe most others. But again, I, I maintain that if Evan works in yeah. two different markets, those are the teams that get outed for cheating. Well, yeah, I mean, if it was like New York and if it was L.A., like you said, you know, yeah, I mean, that's the one of the biggest things. It's like, obviously, I, listen, Houston, what they did was ridiculous. I just think it was ridiculous, you know, stealing signs with guys on base that's been going on forever or whatever. Nobody on, man on first, man on third, single sign from the catcher. You're banging barrels. I mean, that's, that's fucking stupid, right? So everybody else, were they going to that extent? No, but you're right. Like what the Red Sox kind of get caught doing at 18, please. That was just like, we need somebody else. Let's go get them. That was, okay, whatever. Every team was doing that. I mean, you know, with the Astros, that was completely different. But you're right. If he was working on other teams, he probably would have got them. Yeah, but I want to stay positive. Good. By the way, yeah, Pete B positive. has just good. joined us. Uh, Pete, have you met Lou before? Damn, tough intro. Pete's frozen. So <laughs> terrible, <laughs> terrible way to choose Pete. Pete. There you go, Pete. You, What's going you on? There? How are we? There yeah. Go. Okay. Hey. <laughs> Lou, you never made it into the basement at Pete's house, did you? No. No, I don't think I did. Damn, that was a, that was a long list of uh, illustrious guests that we had in the early Section 10 days. No. Um, what did I feel like I missed out on a lot of shit? What did I miss? Yeah. A lot, a lot of shit. It? It's, a good, it's good times down there. There's some yeah, good bet. times that happened down in that basement. Those are those I are bet. like the uh, what's that? What's that bar that all like the celebrities like overdose and died at before uh, like social media and TMZ? You would know this, Pete. The uh, the River oh, Phoenix one. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, oh. uh, like was it like the Snake Lounge or something? Something like that. We're making it sound like we did illegal drugs in there. We didn't. We just were. Yeah, Viper sure. Room. Viper the Viper Room. room. Yes. Yeah. yeah, there you go. Of course yeah, you it, was the, it, was, it was the Viper Room of Red Sox Nation. <laughs> um, okay. So, also, I, you know who Drellick is? Drellick's a kid from Recess with the notepad. The curly-headed kid from that show, Recess, never who just it. tattletales to everybody. He, I mean, he That's does Drellick. tattle. That's Drellick. <laughs> he does tattle. It must be a lonely life. It must be a lonely life for him. But he, I, I, again, oh. I, I, I'm not going to plug the book only because I genuinely don't know what it's called, but I was going to kind of bring this up to the panel uh, because I want to, I don't want to support it, but I feel like for my job, I have to know what's in it. So I'm at a crossroads here. Yeah. Well, you don't don't want to acknowledge it. That's fine. But you sort of read it. If you don't want to talk about it, that's fine. It's for your own knowledge, but you got to find out what's in it. It's It's not just, 
the excerpts we've heard, right? Like that's that's not the whole book, I wouldn't think. Just all about, hey, how can we attack Cora again and, and do a double jeopardy and try to attack the guy for a second crime? But uh, I don't know. I, I, I'm curious. I'm curious to read it because whenever I see things like this, I always sit there and say, okay, who comes out looking good? That's where you find your source, like in a story like this. Who's the guy that's untouched? Who looks good in the whole thing, right? So I am curious to read it. We'll see. Yeah. I think I already know who that is. Yeah, it's, shout out to AJ Hinch. You know, thanks for <laughs> thanks for your contributions. <laughs> he should have wrote the fucking forward to the book. It's so obvious, like who 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 is. Uh, have, you ever seen, have, you, have you ever seen a guy get like a free pass, get like a handpicked little MLB interview, and uh, the manager of a baseball team is taking no blame at all for what went on for six months. The have fact you, that Alex he, Cora he apparently broke a TV once yeah. like, because it, because it didn't work that day. And there was frustration because maybe it didn't work that day. So a TV gets broken. Did they stop doing it? The manager's got no pull. Cora's got more pull than the manager. Beltran's got more pull than the manager. Have you ever seen people <laughs> actually believe this? I, 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 I'm still having a hard time understanding that. Like, yeah. like imagine if you, if you had taken Ron Renicky, like you went back to those days and you saw Ron Renicky trying to boss Alice Cora around, what you would be saying about that conversation. So you have no feel for, yeah. number one, just your coaching staff, but the entire clubhouse, your manager can't lead. And we're talking yeah. AJ Hinch, who had a job seconds after, seconds after his yeah. name was cleared and you got out there. You got a job before anyone. Grow up, please. Yeah. Please. Yeah. It, it's just I like, like it, AJ too. Of course, and he's known. There's a yeah. reason he's re so respected, and we know him and Cora's relationship as well. But it's just one of those things. It's like, like you said, Lou, who looks good again and again yeah. in this conversation? Uh, it's, I've never yeah. seen someone get so little blame for the guy who was leading everything in this whole place. But once yeah, again, you throw it on did. Carlos Beltran. You cost him a job. He mm -hmm. finally can rejoin the Mets organization this year. It's mm -hmm. everyone's fault but him. Cover your ass. It's all it was. Suck on it. <laughs> And like, uh, the, the other half of it is I just don't understand the angle they're trying to go at here. Like you can try to signal it whatever you way you want about Alex Cora's leadership. He was bragging about it in the clubhouse. OK, everything that you want to put or whatever narrative you're trying to build, it got thrown in the absolute fucking dumpster. It's in the dumpster when he came back in 2021. He brought a team that was lifeless to the ALCS that, you know, who knows? Last Diaz, if you get a strike there, maybe you end up in the World Series and something crazy happens. <laughs> What more do you need out of that? It disproves just about everything that you're trying to say. You're trying to criticize Core's yeah. leadership there. Well, obviously, it was enough. And since the other day, back, uh, can I you name one player that's ever spoken about like the Red Sox for like 0 and 31 in like the last 31 games that Laz Diaz managed for the Red I mean, not managed, umpired home plate like, where the yeah. Red Sox are playing. That I would, I would say this. I, and I know, I know Jared, he's your manager, right? Because he is. Yes. Uh, and, mm -hmm. Uh, and obviously I'm biased as well. Like when I, when I saw some of those quotes the other day, I heard people talking about it and it's like, God, he's bragging. I can't believe he's bragging to me. Is it bragging or is it telling this story? Like if a player is like, dude, how did you, what was going on? Well, this is what we did. Yeah. We had it nailed down. You know what I mean? I mean, like we were doing this, we were doing that. We were doing, and it's like, is that bragging or is that telling the story? And I love the source. It's like, who told you Alex Corey said a player. Like, how many guys on that team, Sarah, do you think call him Alex Cora? I, don't, I mean, it's it's crazy. It's AC, Alex, <sighs> AC. I don't know. It's just to me. It's like, is he bragging or is he telling you what he did, what they did? It's like, yeah, this is what we did. You know, I mean, it's just, yeah, we had it freaking nailed down. What do you want me to tell you? He made a huge mistake. He knows it. It was bullshit. He never should have done it. Neither should Beltran. But they got caught up in winning. He already had said that. It was what it yep. was. I don't want to spend a lot of time on it because I fuck Evan Drellick's book, which I'm probably going to read. But who you will, I will. <laughs> I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get the audio book for sure. Um, but I didn't want to I didn't want to veer off from where I was getting earlier with dog walk Twitter video loop. Like this is do it. Like this is setting the Red Sox Twitter space on fire. Uh, it is something that I think a lot of Red Sox fans are now looking forward to, where. It is a very negative space and not even just a negative space. It's like a negligent space and not to not to stir up any sports hub versus EEI drama, but there are some shows and at both stations are guilty that just don't give a fuck about baseball. They just don't, which is great for us. I say thank you. I say thank you to those people because there are plenty of Red Sox fans that are out there that want real baseball talk and Red Sox talk. And all they're doing is just driving fans right to us, which is fucking great. But you 
have been a big proponent of trying to bring baseball talk back to the forefront, at least in Boston sports radio is concerned. Now that's no longer your battle to pick up. So you've taken it to Twitter. So like where, uh, how is the feedback bank? People, I see a lot of people are loving these videos. Where, uh, was the inspiration for it? And, uh, I mean, I, I, I'm just, I'm enjoying you enjoying talking about baseball. That's, that's it for me. Like I'm, I'm going (laughs) to the second layer. The Red Sox fans are enjoying watching the videos. I'm enjoying watching you enjoy talking about baseball. I think it's first off, like you're right. Like when it comes to radio, like I people all the time are like, dude, I can't believe I listen to you. You guys never talk Red Sox. And I'm like, because it's just, just don't do it. Like, you know what I mean? Like whether it's the people you're with and, and you know, some of the guys, like they worked hard at it and they, you know, they tried to follow because they're working with me. I get it, but it was just, wasn't the topic. I felt like I was a Patriot Celtic analyst. So when it came to Red Sox talk, it was on Twitter. And for me, it was like answering people on Twitter. And then I got to the point where I'm like, you know, I can only do so much in a character. I should just do a video. Like some, I don't know when it started, but something came up and I just went, I was walking my dog and, and I was like, you know, I'm not going to answer this on Twitter. You know, I'm going to do a video, you know? And then I just it did like two minute videos just in and out quick and just tried to answer it. Cause it's, you know, you can only put, so you put things in, in Twitter and a character and everybody just sort of dissects it. You can only put so much in there. So just speak it. And whenever big topics came up or my thoughts kind of came in, I would just try to go for a walk with my dog and I would just videotape myself. People wondering if I even have a freaking dog. That's why I introduced <laughs> yeah, them I in, the last, in the last walk. I got another dog too. Then he's pissed off because the other one's now famous. I got to freaking bring the other one out now. Lou so, just walking around his neighborhood, dragging an empty leash, filming himself. <laughs> yeah, the neighbors yeah, like, yeah. what the fuck is this guy's yeah. deal? Yeah. This guy's but I have neighbors every time. once in a while. They're like, dude, you do it around our neighborhood? What's going on? I saw you walk today. I saw you down the street. But uh, no, I just, I, I like it. And it's it's a way to kind of get into it. And granted, it's in only two minutes, right? If it was like three or four minutes, maybe it'd be better. But quick little two minute in and out, um, trying to address some of the things that are on the top of my head. And I, I love it. Well, like all I it's, have to do right now. It's beautiful. All right. It's almost like uh like when your dog walks up to you and gives you the face, like they have to go out, but yeah. you look at Twitter and you see someone ask a question or they make a shitty point that you have a great counter to, and you're like, yeah. All right, I gotta take the dog out. <laughs> it's like your your dog gets walked based on idiocy on Twitter, basically. Yeah. And then one always pays the price because I can't do this with two dogs. No. Like I can't. So my, my wife is, you know, she's home, whatever. We maybe we'll go walk both dogs and it's like, whatever. We just walk the dogs. But if I got to say something, like if I want to do something, you know, I'm like, all right, I'm going to take one of them, hide the other one. Or, well, I've gone out together and told her, you walk in front of me. Like, I got to do some stuff back here. I got to talk about the bullpen. I got to talk about this trade. I got to talk about that. So uh, it gets a little bit weird at times, but when I feel like going for a walk, I'm like, I take one and just sort of sneak out of the house while the other one's pissed <laughs> off because I got to go one on one. I can't take two. I can't do right. that with two dogs. So right. that's what it is. Yeah. I mean, I feel like that's going to have to be a recurring theme throughout the year. But just because you're not doing sports radio does not mean that you're not going to be uh, paid to, to talk about baseball. You're going to be doing games for yeah. EEI. You're going to be doing games in the Nesson booth, which to yeah. me, this felt like. I mean, what are we waiting for type deal? Like, I, I felt like that was something that should have happened 10 years ago. Um, obviously, you had Jerry Remy. I think Jerry Remy first started to get sick in what, 2013 was the first year that he got sick? Yeah. So, I mean, he had like a reduced schedule. Then you have Dennis Eckersley, who wasn't doing, you know, the full 162. Like, there was there was a lane for you to be doing X amount of games on on television and, you know, the counter to that was, well, he does a show on WEI, so EEI's got first dibs. They're going to have him do the games on radio. Uh, yeah. But for me, I just, I don't know. I, I, I It's not like it, it used to be, you know, driving around in the car and, you know, you're listening to the game on the radio. I'm, it's my job now. So I am sitting on the couch watching all the games. Like very rarely am I listening to the game on the radio because it's my job to sit there and watch them. So selfishly, I was like, I want Lou out of the radio booth in, in the television booth. Did you feel like it was only a matter of time before you started doing television? Or did you think that you were going to just be stuck doing radio? I mean, I, I always hoped that it was just a matter of time, right? And I always wondered when that time was. Or that was the biggest thing. I mean, you're, 
you know, you're in radio and you sign a three-year deal and a couple options or something, and all of a sudden an opportunity happens in year two that maybe you can get some time in the booth, and you're like, I can't do it. Like, how do I do it? You know, like, unless I just work weekends, and then do I really want to work five days a week and then do, like, Friday, Saturday, Sunday? You know what I mean? Like, I, that's not – I don't want that. Like, I, I, I still care about my life. I care about my family. I'm not doing that shit. So it was just like, I'd love to do it, but it's just not the right time. Like, it was never – the right time, you know, and this year kind of everything sort of came together and I was thinking about what to do because contracts were coming up and then EI made the decision easy for me. <laughs> you know what I mean? They, they went in a different direction. They put a different show together and I was just like, they wanted me in the radio booth. I'm like, well, okay, well, you know, that's it. Then I got an opportunity maybe to, to see if Nesson is interested, to see if there's any opportunities there. And we started talking about it and, and, um, you know, we came together with, with a number and, and, so combined between the two, you know, I'll be doing, I don't know, 90, 95 games or so uh, between TV and radio. So it's, I'm doing 16 games, I think six on Ness and 10 on EI during spring training. I mean, this is like my job. This is what I do. And it's, I couldn't, professionally, I couldn't be happier. Like it was, it was weird when an EI thing happened. Listen, I, I, I gotta be honest with you. I mean, it's a dream job, right? I played professional baseball for 15 years, played in the big leagues with the Red Sox, and then I did radio for 15. I wasn't exactly digging ditches. I was talking sports. And now I'm in a booth talking Red Sox. So it's like, um, you know, I, I, right now I'm ecstatic because I don't care what the Celtics do with the trade deadline. Like, I don't. <laughs> like, I don't give a rat's ass if Bill Belichick called in the Tom Brady's podcast. Like, I don't care about Pasta's contract. I really don't. I care about depth in the middle of the infield. I care about depth at the catching position. I care about how the bullpen shakes out and if the rotation can stay healthy and if we can get some power and health in the lineup. That's all I give a shit about. And it's freaking beautiful. Like, it's it's professionally, they did me a favor. It's heavy. <laughs> right? That's my world. Milliken, he's just, look at him. Uh, listen, I, I'm, I have the biggest <laughs> smile on my face because this is what I live every single day. Like, I breathe awesome. baseball. It's all mm-hmm. I want. And, like, I get shit on it. Like, people don't want to hear it. Like, all I tweet about, that's what I talk about on air. It's like, listen, yeah. it's cool. I, I'm at a station where we dominate. Mm-hmm. It's Patriots, Celtics, Bruins, you know, Patriots, Celtics most of the time. Mm-hmm. All I want to talk is baseball. That's what drives me. That's what inspires me. So, yeah, yeah. I, I can't relate any more to what Lou is saying than <laughs> what he's saying. Seriously? I think that's why yeah. fans are so excited to have you in the booth. Because, you know, when people talk Red Sox fans like Lou, you get on air and you get kind of framed in this positive light because you're not as negative as a majority of the market. Like, you're not there and it's just... Doom, everything baseball today is garbage. The nerds have ruined the sport. It will never be what it once be. The Red Sox or a you know, poverty franchise at this point. But, you know, you're just willing to say some of the positives. You're willing to say, hey, well, if things go right, this is where this team could go. Do you feel like that's kind of the difference for you coming into the booth this year where, you know, you'll be different than there really hasn't been that powerful voice. Like last year, we had a lot of guys that you know, they were good, but they didn't really offer some of the deep analysis I think people are looking for. Is that kind of the route you're hoping to go here where maybe you can kind of dig a little deeper than some of those guys? Yeah, for, I'll, I'll say this. Like for me, it's like, you know, you said it comes off as positive. And I hear all the time, you call the games, you're paid, you know, by the Red Sox. And I was like, you know, this whole like, angry Lou thing that I kind of had once in a while on the radio, it, the rants were never about the Celtics or the Patriots. It was always about the Red Sox. Like I, it was shred time, you know, and and I just can't help it because I'm passionate. So I still get pissed off when they don't play well. So to me, it's about like balance. Like I, I've always felt like if I go on a broadcast and say every single night that I think a guy's going to throw, you know, eight innings shut up, eight innings shut up. And he does it once every 10 days. And you're like, see, I was right. So it's, everything is positive. It's, everything is positive. That when it's time to, to sit there and praise them, it means nothing. Because there's no criticism that goes with it. You know what I mean? And if everything is negative and there's never any, you know, like positivity when things are going well, then you have no credibility either. So for me, it's still about balance. It's still about, hey, listen, and, and I think that gives you credibility. You know, when you're willing to criticize when a team's playing like dog shit, you know, and actually admit it and be like, this isn't acceptable at this level. You know, you got to make these, plays, whatever. But so then when they're playing well and you praise them, I think it means more. You know, because there's somewhat of a balance. It's just, you mentioned it, the ounce of positivity on sports radio about the Red Sox. And you're a homer because everybody is lazy. They don't really watch 162. They don't care about baseball. So the easiest thing to do is say baseball sucks. This team sucks. It's boring. Because they, they would rather do that than actually watch 
and analyze the team and actually deep dig, you know, dig into something, you know, and try to find what the hell's going on. So <laughs> just the way it is. You literally just answered my question before I could even ask it. I, I was going to straight up ask, do you think that if you're, if you're just negative all the time about the Red Sox, it's because you're not actually paying attention and it's just easier to, to take shots than it is to actually pay attention and have a positive thing to say? Yeah, and I think, you know, whether if it's sports radio, you're just you're trying to get that audience. You know what I mean? Um, so, But don't they understand this, that like there that are Red Sox that. fans that are dying for positive Red Sox talk on sports radio? And yeah. it doesn't come. I mean, like it, it's just not there. It, it's, it's, it's almost what I don't understand. And maybe it's because of uh, like John Henry is a nerd and Tom Warner's yeah. old and Heim Bloom's a nerd that uh, it's, it's just it's almost like the cool thing to make fun of the Red Sox. Like the, it's not cool to like the Red Sox. Yeah. I don't, I don't understand it. I don't, I don't know where along the line, because John Henry and Tom Warner were the owners uh, for four championships. It was cool to like the Red Sox when they were winning world series titles, but somewhere along the line, it just, because of some sports radio talk, it just became like, you're not cool unless you hate the Red Sox. You're not cool unless you yeah. actively root against them, even though you live in Boston. I, d- I just don't get where it came from or why it's even a thing. Yeah, it is a little bit of a, like a mob mentality. Um, but when it comes to radio, like that's you mentioned like positive talk. Positive talk doesn't get any interaction with sports radio. Positive talk doesn't get calls. Positive talk doesn't get people calling in upset. Like the best example I could give you is early on doing radio was 2011. Remember the greatest team ever? Like for five yeah. months, they five months they were, and there was nothing to talk about. Oh, they're great again. Oh, they won again. Oh, this guy's great. That guy's great. When chicken and beer happened in September, that's all we talked about for three hours. That's all people wanted to talk about for four hours because it was negative. For five months, they're great. There's just nothing. Guys driving around this car. Team's great. What am I going to call up and say, yeah, I agree with you. Click. Thanks for the call. First time, long time. Like there's nothing to talk about. So that's why like negative topics drive it. So if you're going to talk Red Sox, we're only going to talk about them if it's time to hammer them. That's it. Because that, first off, that's all we know. You know, we don't know the game. We don't follow the team. So that's all we got, you know. So that's just – and it's a little bit of a mob mentality. Yeah, they're an easy target. You know, I love it. People like – I think, you know, and I, I tweeted about Sean to see who will listen. I, I, he got a job to do. I think he's fantastic at it. You know, and, and he does follow baseball. He likes baseball regardless. Maybe not as much as he once did. Well, he referenced something about like the 80s, you know, back when people were like in the baseball and the 90s, back when people were into baseball. And it's like, wait, was, was ownership good back then? Did ownership go out and spend money back then? Did ownership keep all the local talent, homegrown talent like Fisk and Lind and Boggs and Clemens and move on? Like, did they not trade them and let them walk and then destroy them on the way out? Like, and that was the glory days? Meanwhile, these guys, they spend money. You can question how they do it. John Henry is different. He's not very social. He hates talking to the fans. And that's probably his biggest issue because he doesn't like doing it. And when he does, he gets himself in trouble. Uh, so I understand where the frustration is lately with how we're seeing this team sort of what they're turning into and who left. But now nah, it's, it's, yeah, it's just the way it is right now. It's weird. Weird yeah. time. Yeah. But now you're in a position where you can just do your own thing. Like you're not yeah. at the mercy of people needing to call in to your show. Uh, to generate interest, you can just right. fire up your cell phone and talk baseball. Kind of like, it, I mean, we didn't, we weren't negative on the baseball show. I mean, the only time we were negative is when when Buckholtz or Sandoval came up. Yeah, yeah, I know. Well, when you called in talking about Benny need to be buttoned or whatever it was, Benny be buttoned. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna like pull that, that up. I'm gonna, you when know what? You know what? I just realized the other day, Lou, and it's it's quite depressing. Is I, like I'm getting old now. Like I, I was, uh, yes. Like I was, um, what did I tweet about? Oh, when it that, that night that it was negative nine in Boston last mm-hmm. weekend. And I tweeted, you know, it's cold when the temperature is lower than Pablo Sandoval's wins above replacement during his Red Sox tenure. And people were tweeting me being like, What's your beef with Pablo? And I'm like, holy fuck. Like we have we have moved to a point where New people generation. who follow me don't know about me and Pablo. And right. it, it made me sad. I was like, 
I was like, how many years before people like don't know about like the parade or they don't know about like all the shit that we did in 2018? How far like if because the Pablo shit was what? That was like 2015. Yeah. So yeah. I've got a three yeah. year buffer before people forget about 2018. Yes. That's, that, yeah. that may not be that may not be like a time thing either. It could just be a bunch of new people on board that weren't following you and don't know you. I think so. it's truly like we've talked about it on here. Be- there's the newer kind of group of fans, the younger fans, like that 12 to 14 year old. They have a player as their avatar on Twitter and they're kind of analytically yeah. based. <clears throat> when you guys were doing the baseball show, I was like 15. I was well, 50. It, do 60, you know, do you know Betty Teddy B. Bunton? Yes, I, I remember. Right. I all so the people the that don't know. Here it is. I, I got it right here. All right, let's uh, let's get back to the phone calls. I want to go to Steve in Weymouth. Steve, go ahead, buddy. You're on the baseball show. Uh, obviously, we can all agree here that uh, starting pitching is definitely the number one strength for this team. But the offense, good. the offense is definitely lacking with David Ortiz having retired. So, what do you think about Andrew Benintendi bunting more in the postseason? How do you collect the correct? I mean, connect the two. I don't understand. You say David Ortiz is the biggest difference, and you want Benintendi to bunt? The, the, the offense has been struggling without David Ortiz. So I'm saying if you get more base runners on, you've got more guys that can score runs. You need Betty Teddy to be bunting at the top of the order. Why Benintendi? <laughs> uh, I mean, I'm, ser- I'm dead serious. Like, I'm just curious. Like, he's one of the most consistent hitters. <laughs> Uh, I'd say you need him to maybe have a David Ortiz ask or somebody to step up. I, I want as many guys. Credit to you for answering it possible. logically. I don't understand why you pick him to bunt. <laughs> all all I'm bunt. saying is you need more base runners, Lou. I tell you once, I tell you a thousand times. Also, Tim Britton, I think you do a great job, but uh, that Carabas guy is uh, much more handsome than you. <laughs> yeah, that hurts. I mean, that hurts. I- I'm glad we got that opinion from the guy who still wants bunting in baseball. Wait, Steve, you got something else? It's Jared. What's up, guys? Who's this? It, it's Parabas. What? Oh, so that's why you're saying you're much better looking than, than, than Britain. I agree. Did you just prank yeah. us? <laughs> you just pranked us. You want like Ben and oh, Come on. That's so weak. Steve from Weymouth. Uh, <laughs> Tim Britton unfollowed me after that. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> hey, yeah. That sounded nothing like you. I don't even get upset at myself for not figuring out that's you. You yeah. shouldn't hear. I mean, I, I, like I, I wouldn't it say it sounds nothing should, like him. It's, well, it's just more like it, it's definitely a voice. It's definitely a voice that I do on the podcast to make fun of callers like that. So like, yeah, I think, uh, I think the bigger thing is that it sounds like every caller, <laughs> yeah. rather than it doesn't sound anything like you. Yeah, yeah like there was. Yeah. Uh, I got to go back and find it, but there was a clip from the baseball show where some guy called in and had this outrageous take, and I just looked into the hard cam and I was like the fuck is this guy talking about like i think i said oh i remember it now because you <laughs> i was off camera and i started laughing and then you're, he's addressing the question to you and you're just like trying not to laugh as he's as i'm cracking up off the camera i was making fun of that guy because he used to yeah. call every week with like these like good. totally out of date like baseball references and questions <clears throat> so oh, i knew good. i knew that i could call in and ask a question like that and you would answer it because people like that would call into the baseball show. That's just what it was. I think my favorite part, I think my favorite part of that that you nailed is like somebody bringing up a stupid point and then Lou asking them to explain further and then you just repeating the same point and then being like, I already told you. <laughs> you need more base runners, players. Lou. I tell you once, I tell you a thousand times, Lou, you got to get more base runners on. The Betty Teddy be bunting. <laughs> David Ortiz, having retired. Like, they would call in from like Framingham and all these places. They would have these ridiculous Boston accents. And I'm just like yeah. sitting there being like, this is, this is a sitcom. Like that show yeah. at times when we had callers yeah. was an actual sitcom. I know they did away with the callers too, but that's like, well, that's, that gets length to the show, right? Like you can take callers all freaking day long, right? And yeah. they did away with it. That was always fun. I love talking to those guys. Yeah. Socks. Yeah. Good good times. Good times. Good time. Are you gonna miss the callers? Are you gonna miss are you gonna miss no. like but are you are you going to miss the dumb things that people say that almost get the wheels spinning in your brain to where you come up with a thought that maybe you've never even considered? No. <laughs> no, I'm not miss it at all because you still get those dumb things on Twitter. Like I don't listen, and people people say all the time, like oh, ask me all the time, like why do you even respond? 
Like, why do you respond so much to a dude that's like an egg that has like one follower? And, and honestly, lately I'm like sitting there and I'm like tweeting out and I'm responding to this guy. And then finally I get through it. I'm like, what the fuck am I doing? Delete. Yeah. You know, move well, on. But I'm like, just get out of here. Like, what, why am I? I'm not, I don't need to be in that world anymore. Like, I, no. I, I don't. I'm, I'm but it's good. almost like uh, it's almost like stupid people on Twitter are essentially coming up with the thesis for your next dog walk video. Like oh, yeah. if there are. So what I will do, because people will be like, why are you responding to this dude with two followers? I'll I, I'll never directly reply. But if I feel like there are enough people with this same dumb thought, then I can quote tweet it. Not to address this one person, but I'm addressing all the dumb people who think this way. And if you do yeah, it as a I've quote tweet, too. then it's like everyone can see it. Everyone can see my response to it and everyone can yeah. see how stupid this person is. Yeah, no, I agree. When you start seeing like similar dumb shit, you're like, all right, just pick out some idiot. Like, you know, yeah. like pick out somebody, right? Yeah. Like I, the people are like, why do you get zero followers? I'm like, do you really think like I hit the dude's like profile? Like, I don't. I hit his tweet. I don't. I don't know if he's got 20,000, 100,000, a million followers or four. Like I'm responding to a tweet and you're right. Like if a lot of it's very similar, that's kind of the guy you pick out. And they're like, why'd you respond to him? I'm like, whatever. I mean, honestly, I'm freaking bored. <laughs> I'm bored. I'm just sit around. Yeah. I'm sitting yeah, around. And you're making an I'm example responding. out of this guy. Yeah. Yeah. So whatever. <clears throat> it's all good. It's, that's why I like the walks. I can expand on it a little bit. It's nice. Yeah. And I mean, by the way, I was in Home Depot the other day and it yeah. wasn't your most recent dog walk video. It was the one before that. You had the little beanie on. I was like, Lou yeah. Maloney might be the most handsome man in, in Boston sports media right now. You you are aging incredibly. I just had to point that out. Well, I appreciate that. I did see that. I was going to actually quote tweet that and tweet it, but I just left it there. Just, just left it there for, for, for people to take in. Yeah. <laughs> I think Carabas is more handsome than you. <laughs> yeah. Definitely more than Britain. <laughs> Definitely more than Brent, especially after he unfollowed me. That made him twice as ugly. Oh, I can't uh, believe he did that to you. Bullshit. Question for you professionally now. Yeah. Uh, do you think that you're going to have a different approach to broadcasting on radio versus broadcasting on television? Or are you just going to like see it and talk about mm -hmm. it? Like, is there is there going to be a difference for you in the way that you handle the two? That's a good question. And it's something that like I uh, you know, talk to some people about right now. I, I'm used to doing radio. I've always done like 35 games on radio. I've called World Series and things like that. And it's more descriptive, right? Like no one sees shit. So, you, you, you know, now you're talking about how he went two steps to his left, got around it. That, you know, you're describing a play that people don't see, right? TV, I'm watching it with him. Like I'm watching it with him, right? So it's like I don't need to talk about how he took two steps. I need to talk about how he finished the play, you know, and – pitch sequence or whatever it might be. So for me, honestly, that part is new. Like that part is, that part's exciting. That part is new. Like I'm, I'm used to doing radio. Uh, so jumping on the TV is sort of like, I, I don't expect to go out there, and, you know, and be great at this. You know what I mean? Like, you know, I'm going to go out there and just be me. And in time sort of figure out, um, you know, what works, what didn't work. Like I'm, you know, it, it's like how I do my job on radio. Like, you know, like, it's just a lot of prep work. Milliken knows. I mean, there's a lot of prep work, whether if it's hockey, basketball, football, you dive in, you make contacts, you read, you research, you try to get better every single day. And it's like the same approach, even though it's a sport that I know, but it's a different animal. So I'm going to be kind of learning and doing some games in spring training and trying to, you know, figure that out as well. But it's something I'm excited about. I got a question. How much do you think about like keeping yourself in check in terms of like the homerism, I, I guess, like because this this market for sure embraces homers, homer broadcasters. I mean, look at Jack Edwards yeah. and, uh, you know, just they so, like that kind of stuff. A lot of people do. But I mean, and you're also a local guy. You, you, you played for the team. You clearly passionate about the team. How much do you think about like maybe I should tone this down? Maybe I should not be like over the top or do you kind of just like, fuck it, I'm going to be myself and and give my point of view and not water it down at all yeah i i it's something i've kind of thought about i mean to me it's like i, I don't really think you can fake anything like you know if you're just not you eventually you just get exposed you know what i mean i, I do think there's some people out there that are like uh oh yeah you know he was he was this he was that on radio and now that he's gonna be watered down and and, and it's like if in game one if i don't shred 
every single player, they're like, he sucks. You know what I mean? Like, that's not what we thought he was going to be. And it's like, dude, it ain't going to be like that. I'm sorry. Like, if if there's time to be critical, I'll be critical. I'll always, you know, be respectful. Don't make it personal or whatever, you know? And if there's time to be positive, you're positive. So, you're right. I mean, I look around now like Scal and you got Jack and Brick and you got Zoe and it's like, I don't see anybody up there shredding anybody. You know what I mean? So, um, no, it's still your team. Like, it's still – I care too much about this team. So, I want them to do well. But if they don't do well, I'm like a fan. I get pissed off too, you know, because it's just like you don't want to see it. You know, when they're building a team in the offseason, I'm just sitting there pulling my hair out. I'm like, okay, go here, go here, get this guy, get that guy. You know, make a powerhouse, whatever. Win every single freaking game. I know it's not going to happen, but um, I just think you got to be yourself. And if you're not yourself, you get exposed, period. I'm curious about this because uh, I know Remy would go in the clubhouse all the time. Uh, and when you're doing radio, those guys, they don't, they don't even go, never mind going to the clubhouse. They don't go to the games. Uh, yeah. So are you planning on being more present when you're, when you're a booth guy versus a talk show host? Are you going to be bopping around batting practice? Are you going to be available if, like, say you said something on the broadcast and so-and-so didn't like it and they want the opportunity to approach you? Are you going to make yourself available in that way? Because it's just, it's different than being a a talk show host. Yeah, I plan on it. You know, I mean, for me, it's, I want to get as much information as I can to do my job. And part of that is being on the field VP or talking to a player or having something to talk about extra, you know, other than the game or a coach and, reports and things like that. And if you say something that people don't like, then you should be there. Listen, I played, you know, and, and whether somebody said something, whether it was, I don't know if you remember this, Jared, but this is probably when you were a youngin. <laughs> but when Ben Affleck is shredding me, you know, on a broadcast, because, you know, Sean McDonough is up there with him in the booth. I want to talk to Sean. I'm not talking to Ben. He's already gone. Right. So it's like, I want to be able to talk to you about it. So I feel like you kind of have to be, and I know, I know Eck tried to, like, stay away, you know, and obviously the David Price thing was a little bit strange. Um, that's something I'll have to just kind of feel out. But I, I feel like if I say anything negative and people want to talk to me about it, then I should be there to talk to them about it. You know, there's, there's been a lot of turnover, especially this past offseason. Do you have, besides, like, AC, is there anyone that you can, like, th- that you can just, like, open up your phone and just have that conversation? After a game, it's like, hey, what, what was you know, your thought process during like that play or that at bat, uh, like, do you have any tight relationships now or did you, or do you not because of when doing, I guess, talk radio, you try to distance yourself more. I mean, as far as players go, it's, it's there's so much turnover in the last couple of years. It's almost like right. starting new relationships, you know? And it's like, I think a lot of these guys, a lot of these guys probably know, will, will know me more as kind of like a broad, the broadcaster than they will of the radio. Number one, I never talked baseball, you know? I mean, we just, yeah. we never really did. So it's like, you know, who are the veterans? Like, I don't think Devers is listening to WEEI, you know? <laughs> I just, Maybe so he, he does. Me, you know, he's, I, I don't know if he does or not, but, you know, like Kike. Kike's been a guy now that's been here a few years. So it's, I don't know, Chris Sale, right? Like, how many guys have been here more than three years, right? So, um, I don't know. Now it's about like forming new relationships. You're the broadcaster. It is what it is. This is what I did for a living. Um, but a lot of those guys are gone now as far as connections go, whether it's coaches or an office scouts, people with other organizations kind of is a lot of that kind of stuff. Other organizations, scouts around the league. A lot of the guys that I played with are now within organizations, you know, whether it's staff, just the GMs, front office, whatever it might be. Those are some of the guys that, that I know that I'm close with still. Lou, I know a lot of people. I feel like the most common thing I get on Twitter when we're talking who's in the Nesson booth these days is they miss when there yeah. was someone out there that they knew was going to be on every single night. That was a thing with Remy. Like I knew Remy was going to be in the booth. I could look forward to it. Now with a little bit of the revolving door, it changes. You're part of that. Do you think down the road, if things go well this year, you would be someone who was willing to take kind of a higher road? Obviously, you got the radio <laughs> side as well. But could you envision yourself carrying at least, you know, something like Uke's workload this year where you're one of the main voices of that Nesson rotation moving forward? 
More. Yeah. Can you can you do 130 fucking games, Lou? Answer the question. 130. <laughs> That's Plus. what the fans are looking for. And I know like you've talked about it, Lou, yeah. with your son. Do like, you have he, the do you have the fucking balls to do 130 games, Lou Maloney? <laughs> Well, that's why we're starting off this year around 9095, right? Like, because it's, it's a new life. It's new. So it's, uh, uh, I think I can handle it. You know, I'm looking forward to doing 9095 and probably when the season's over, sit there and say, I can do a buck 20. I don't know what that's going to be. I mean, they got a lot of guys right now, right? I mean, you, you is going to be in there for a lot. Well, Middlebrooks will be there. Wakey, Millar. I mean, they, they have a lot of guys. So I don't, I'm not going to sit there and say, yeah, I want to, you know, I want to do more or whatever. I mean, whatever's available, I'll do. I mean, but I plan on, you know, if, if whether it's both radio, TV, or one or the other, like I, this is what I want to do. Like this is, this is me, you know, off into the sunset. You know, this is what I plan on doing for a long time. And if it's 120, 130 games, so be it. I'm in. Yeah. And that's just, that's just, it is what it is. You know, like I, cause I know that uh, you wanted to watch your son play baseball. Like, cause we were talking yeah. about different like time slots for sports radio. And like you wanted to, you, you liked your time slot. Cause you could watch him play baseball. You could be around. And now, cause that's what I always used to tell myself because I, I wanted you in the booth doing nesting games. Like I wanted you to do TV and I just would tell myself, you know, don't, don't get too excited because you know, he wants to watch his son. It's like, well, someday his son is going to get old and he's, <laughs> he's, 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 he's gonna, he's gonna either Good. get drafted yeah. and play pro ball. Well, yeah. and Lou's going to have to, he's going to have to cut the cable. Well, like he's, it's going to get to that point right where uh, yeah. it's going to get to that point where Lou is going to be have more availability to do these games. So now I'm just I'm excited because I, I'm we're, we're dipping our toes in this year with X amount of games. But I do because I mean, you look at the, the list like Kevin Euclid, uh splits time between what Cincinnati and California. Uh, Will and Jenny live down in Florida. Millar's in Texas. I mean, to do, to take, like, if, if, the, if that's truly what the fans want, which I think the, that is what the fans want. I'm not saying it's a preference of personality. I think the fans want an individual who's all in, not just like a, 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 a mixed bag of personalities, which, you know, it, it, it's fine to have the mixed bag of personalities. But with that mixed bag, we want the consistent person uh, with, with OB. Because, I mean it's different between uh, color and, and being an analyst, but that's kind of what I'm hoping for you. And I just, I'm happy to hear that if, if it's on the table, that that's something that you're willing to take on. Do we lose you? No, no, you just it froze there a little bit, I think, but okay. um, I'll say this uh, where I was, it's it's funny because now it's like I get this I get this off season. I spent the last month and a half with practicing three days a week, and I almost feel like it's more valuable to be part of that, you know, with some of these kids and my son. And the way the schedule is right now, even with ninety five games, he kind of plays to like mid July, you know. And so the way everybody really worked together real well with it, to where maybe a couple times I miss back to back weekends, but it's like every third weekend I might miss. And I started to realize last year that that's probably the best thing for him. Like having me there all the time isn't exactly the best for him. Let him just go and do his thing, you know, without me once in a while. So I started to feel a little more comfortable with it, you know, this year. And again, this is sort of like the trial balloon. I'll, I'll say this, like I, as much as I, I love this job and this is what my dream and what I want to do, there is nothing more important than my mom, you know, my wife and my son. So um, I'll, and, and I kind of figure like you got a little more time, you know, you got the off season, you still got some weeks off during the summer. So, I'm sort of feeling this thing out. You know, 95 games is a good start. And I think when it's all said and done, I'll sit there and say, okay, that worked pretty good. You know, maybe you can put a little bit more on my plate, whether it's whichever side it is. How do you like go about prepping for like an increased workload in that space? Like I've never broadcasted and stuff. I, I would assume that like a lot of it's just trying to be as prepared as possible with as much information as possible. But like, how do you, how do you even practice or like, try to get reps in that space and, and brace yourself for like a bigger workload. Is it just doing it more? Yeah, I think, you know, getting reps and things like that, doing 30, 35 on the radio side, 40, 45 in playoffs, that type of thing. Like that's, those are the reps, right? Like mm -hmm. that's, that's work. Like that's what you do as far as prep goes. It is the one great thing about it. I remember doing, 
you, know, you, you prepare for a four hour radio show, right? And you got it. You got, you know, minute every 15, 20 minutes, whatever it is, this is where we want to go next. This is what you tease. This is what you do. When I jump in the radio booth, it's like, you got your scouting reports, you got some stats you want to run with and the script isn't written. And that's the beautiful thing. Like to me, I, you watch the game and react like this is the script, like, and it's unknown. So you're sort of like waiting to find out what happens next to be trying to observe. You're trying to see, you know, pick up things that you might see going through it. So the preparation is just the outside stuff. Like today, for example, I saw I, I watched some video for an hour and a half on the rule changes that MLB put up, you know what I mean? To understand like all the different rules, all the different intricacies of, of, of what's going to be happening. Umpires, different stuff. I mean, that's, that's to me is prep work. Right, getting to know this roster, going to the spring training, expecting to see a lot of young players, trying to get to know those guys. Talk to the people that know those guys better than I do. You know, I mean, to me, that's that's prep. So when you get there, I, I want to know it. I don't want to be reading shit off a piece of paper. I want to put it in my brain and be able to talk about it openly, not look at some notes and read off some stats. You know what I mean? So that prep work is done before. When the game starts, it's an open book. You have no idea what's going to happen. And I kind of learned that when I was doing games on the radio. Side note, uh, yeah, Big Cat just texted me, and he oh. said, are, "Are you around to be uh, phone a friend for trivia?" I should just tell him yes and have him call in, and then if one of us knows the answer, we can just say <laughs> I, the answer. I got the same. I got the same text from PFT about uh, NHL because they're doing the dozen trivia thing. Yeah, he was like, "Are you around?" Funny. And I was like, "Sure am." So. <laughs> sure am. <laughs> He just calls in and asks a baseball question, and we have a panel of five nerds that are just like ready to go. Yeah, what do you need? All right, I'll tell him. I'll tell him the call. I'm gonna tell him the call. Yeah, (laughs) that actually be very funny. Um, I wanted to get to talking about the actual Red Sox team because uh, uh, this is this is where I'm at. I'm very much in a state of what if. I'm not negative, although some folks may think that I am. I'm not. I'm not mm-hmm. I'm not dreading this year. I'm not using the term bridge year. I'm not saying World Series or bust. I'm not thinking playoffs really. But if a lot of things go right, which it's happened before, it's not impossible for things to go right. I think we're just our brains are broken into thinking, well, these all of these things can go wrong and if they do, then we're fucked. Okay, but what if they go right? So I'm I'm kind of just I'm in wait and see mode. I'm not thinking that it's I'm not dreading the season and I'm I wouldn't say that I'm super overly excited about it, but crazier things have happened and it's not it's not even one of those things where you don't have the talent to do it. It's just again to you know the points that you were making today uh in your video about the rotation. A lot a lot of things have to go right, but if they do, it's a good team. It could, it's it, you could fuck around yeah. and find out with this team. Yeah, I agree. I get sort of like that wait and see thing. I mean, everybody off season, get this guy, get this guy. I think for me, I think the frustrating thing for me, and, and maybe this is kind of like times times time here in, in Boston. I feel like you could always go like that one step further to make life easier. You know what I mean? Like, like, great. We could sit there and say, Chris Sale, there's no fluke injury. His arm is healthy. That is awesome. But can you imagine if his arm is healthy if you got a Rodone to go with him? Can you imagine if his arm was healthy if you had a Bassett to go with him or a guy down in Miami to go with him? Now you're talking about a definite playoff team. You know what I mean? And it's like, okay, we we got Kike, we got Arroyo, we're going to trade for Mondesi. It's like, oh, that's, that, that's nice. But why don't you just go get Iglesias and just put Kike at second and have Arroyo be a utility guy and Mondesi, if he's ever healthy, like, I, I don't know if his career ever screams starter to me anyways. Like, I, I don't know. There's potential. You know, there's potential with a lot of this stuff, but it's always like this one more step to make life easier. You know, go get a starting right fielder. Ah, oh, we can get by with Jackie. Yeah, but you probably could use a starting right fielder. You know what I mean? Like, go get one more definite arm in the rotation that I can count on and feel better about. Well, our rotation could be good. Yeah, I know, but it could be better if you get this guy I feel better about. So this is, that's kind of where I'm at. And, and now you're right. You're ready to wait and see. Can all these guys, can they stay healthy? Can they perform? Can they compete for a playoff spot? Meaningful games in September. You know, that's kind of what you need. That's what you need. Um, what's your relationship like with Haim? Have you met him? Do you guys have a relationship? 
Mm-hmm. What yeah, uh? Yeah, we've. What are you, What are your thoughts? Uh, yeah, no. We listen. I, I I respect the guy because he's pretty much he has a plan and he doesn't really give a shit like what anyone else thinks. Like he's just like this is what we're doing. We're making smart baseball trades. We're making smart baseball signings. You have the right to disagree with me. I'm not saying I'm always right. And a lot of people do disagree, you know, with some of that stuff. But he has a plan. Like he's, to me, he's always been receptive, you know, whether it is communications. I've had talks with him about, you know, I don't, you know, why did you do this? Why do we, why did you do that? Why did you do this? But I get it. Like I don't by any means think it's an easy job. You know what I mean? Putting a team together. Um, so, I mean, I, I think he has a vision. I just sometimes I wonder, you know, like what that is. And it's always like we're going to build through the system. We're going to build this. And it's almost like he speaks like it's a guarantee. And I think every team tries every – last I checked when teams had a draft, they draft players they think are going to be good. You know, every team does that. So it's like wait to see our draft. Wait to see this kid. Wait to see that kid. Well, every team is saying that. There's no guarantee that these guys you think are good in A ball are going to be great in in, in triple A you know, big leagues, and it's almost like he's he's all in on that. I just sometimes I think in this city the focus should be more on a big league club than building from within. And I wonder in a big market you should be able to do both. So, but he's open to talk, and I respect that, and he has a plan. Yeah, what's up with him making fucking Chris Catillo his his like mouthpiece these days? Yeah, what the fuck is that? Chris, like, has, Chris has got all of it this offseason, doesn't he? I mean, he's 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 gotten a lot of uh, info, but I feel like anytime that Heim has like a quote or a statement, it comes from Chris Cotillo. Like, what the fuck is yeah. that? Yeah. Well, he's open to talk to the media. I know that. Like, whether it's you know podcasts or interviews, and he he has no problem kind of standing there, like you know, at that freaking winter weekend thing. Like, you could say what you want, and they booed him, and people have the right to boo him, and I know people are frustrated and. And if you want to boom, God bless you. But he stood up there and they, they just, they took it, you know, and they still kind of tried to tell everybody what his vision was and see if it pans out. Well, I mean, I, I'm not going to ask you if you believe that he has a vision. I'm assuming you do believe that, but do you trust it? I guess would be more the phrasing. I think there are times when I think everybody just, it's baseball, right? There's no one way to build a team. There's no one way belief. And whether it's minor leagues, free agents, trades, whatever it might be. Um, I, I, there are times when I'm sort of like, okay, I'm, I'm wondering where this is going. You know, I'm wondering, you know, at the deadline and when I was talking before, like go that extra step. Like I think at the deadlines, it's like, he's always got just enough, you know? And it's like, God, I've been in that locker room. I know, you know as well as I do that the last couple of years, guys in that locker room are like, dude, what the fuck? Like, just, like, get us a guy to get us over the hump. I've been on teams that we had the deadline. We're like, God, we need help. We don't get it. You know, and it's like, you get the speech. We believe in you. You know, that's why we didn't go and say, no, that's what you say when you didn't get anybody. Because I guarantee your ass, when you make a trade for, like, some freaking stud, you're going to tell us that's why you got it, because you believe in us. And that's what I think this team has wanted. So um, and that's what I mean. Deadlines, free agents, it's like playing around with some players that are good. Then when you put them all together, they're interesting. I'll say that all these free agent signings, individually, nothing, none of them blow you away. You know? But when you start adding up Yoshida and Duvall and Turner, you know, and you know Casas is at first and, and not your boy Bob, you know, you're sort of like, okay, I, I kind of like all of them together. Not that I like any of them individually. And that's what it's really about, though, right? Building a team. So we'll see. Stay healthy. Yeah. yeah that's, it's, it, I just feel like when you talk about this Red Sox team, it's impossible to not use yeah. classic baseball cliches. Well, if they stay healthy, you know, play 162, you never know. You know, it's, it's like, well, I think, I think fans would feel a lot more comfortable, especially hearing from someone like yourself. Where it's like, I believe that X, Y, and Z will happen versus if Chris Sale stays healthy, if James Paxton stays healthy, if Corey Kluber can give you 130 innings. Like, what would you say? Uh, I guess you can go down that list because right now, do, do you think that Paxton's going to be in the rotation to start the year? I don't. And I don't know what that role is. And I saw a state comment from Heim or something talking about like, <laughs> Making someone do someone they haven't done their whole career is a tough ask. Yeah, that was and from was uh, like, Catillo's podcast. 
Of course it was. Fucking so, guy. Then, <laughs> so, but I'm just saying, like, you know Sales there. You know Pavetta's there. You know, to me, it's like, you know Kluber's there. Bayo is there. Whitlock is there. You know, and I'm like, uh, where's this guy fitting in? And, and my response to that, like, comment, I was just like, uh, for 100 years, guys have changed jobs. You know, how many – it's not impossible for a starter to be a reliever. Like, they've done it their whole careers. Like, well, in the time of baseball, that happens all the time. I don't know where that role is. I can see if he's feeling good out of camp that he is that, that piggyback guy. Six-man rotation makes no sense to me. All you do is destroy and wear out your bullpen. Guy goes four innings. If, you know, three out of six guys go four innings, you're fucked. Mm-hmm. So, but if you piggyback Paxton, now you can save your bullpen. Somebody goes four, he goes four, go to your closer, you've saved everybody for a day. I don't know what that role is, but I don't think the other five guys are in it. Well, who's your horse? Like, who's, who's the guy? I mean, no one's giving you 200 innings. Uh, no. 180 seems far-fetched. Who's your 160 guy? Pavetta. Pavetta, yeah. You, and you year. need him. You need him to give you that. And he's another one, like, I, a lot of people yeah. have floated and wanted to say, like, throw him to the bullpen. And Jen McCaffrey confirmed, like, a week ago, saying, no, there's been no conversations of moving Pavetta to the bullpen either. They view him as a starter because he's the one guy you know who will make 30 starts for you. Pavetta and Kluber, I want innings. If it's a four and a half ERA, so be it. Like, you know, Pavetta, he'll pitch like an ace for about a month, right? Like, that's just what he does. And hopefully he pitches better against the AL East. But those are the guys you need innings from. The, the, I think the upside comes from the other three. Like, you know what I mean? So if I get a fourth or fifth starter in this league with a 4-5, four, 4-6 four, ERA and give me 160 innings, that's a freaking W. You know, now I need Sale, Bale, and Whitlock to pitch at a high level. And now we, you got a good rotation. Can that happen? You got Paxton unfold. You got you know guys like Hulk who could jump in there. I kind of like Crawford. You got some arms in AAA who I haven't seen much of. So, like I said, like I said that that walk the other day, it's about when the injuries happen, right? Like if you, I wouldn't be shocked at all if somebody comes out of camp with a dead arm and doesn't misses a rotation for the first two weeks, and Hulk's in the rotation, or Crawford's in the rotation, or somebody's in the rotation. But you can't lose three guys at once. You can't, like last year, they lost four guys at once. You're done. Lose one guy at a time, maybe two tops, you know, and you could stagger it. You got enough of the arms there. Lou, so like I'm someone who talked a lot about the six man rotation earlier in the offseason, I'd say, especially when we were around like the Kodai Sanga stuff and you were talking, you come over from Japan, you pitch once a week. Now, the Astros, they relied heavily on it last year because they had, you know, a lot of pitchers dealing with injuries. Uh, Justin Verlander off of Tommy John, Christian Javier, who I think resembles Garrett Whitlock in a lot of ways as a reliever going into kind of a starter role. The Padres did the same thing until they dealt uh, Mackenzie Gore in the Juan Soto trade. I think my question is, and I I don't blame the Red Sox. Brian O'Halloran shut it down a couple times now, uh, you know, saying we haven't talked six man rotation yet. I think they just want to get to spring training and see where it goes, because if something is wrong with someone. Just don't pin yourself. Stop saying things are going to happen. They did that so many times last year, and then it was egg on their face. If you're going to keep, you know, Chris Sale healthy, how many innings can you expect? Hopefully 100 from him this year. You know, you're not probably expecting 150. Garrett Whitlock, someone who's never thrown, you know, 100 innings in the big leagues. Brian Bayo, his first full season. We've talked James Paxton. Is the six-man rotation, while that would cut you an arm in the bullpen, and I think some people have forgotten, like, Listen, it's 13 and 13. You can't go in with a three-man bench like you did last year and maneuver the pitching staff like you did. Mm -hmm. Is there a way to get by? Because that feels like maybe the only way you can hope a Chris Sale, a James Paxson, or a Garrett Whitlock, Bayo could be effective by September. Because, yeah, you may get off to a hot start, but would you be surprised if any of those guys are completely gassed by the time you get to the end of the year? Yeah, see, the only thing, Tyler, that worries me about like six-man rotation is... Like in April, we see the way the guys work. First off, you've got Sale, you've got Kluber, it's the same Paxton's in it. And maybe even Whitlock, given his history as a starter, you, they're not going to go past five, right? So they're going to go four. Uh, you know, and five if they're going well. If they're getting hit around, they may go four. You have a couple guys do that back to back with a seven man bullpen. And yeah, how could come in one game, but you know, if it's a blowout, you're not going to use them. Crawford could come in one game and be a long reliever. Like, how do you withstand three out of six guys giving you just four? Like, where, now you start burning Hauk. Now you start burning Crawford. You know, now you got, you know, Brazier in there in the fifth inning trying to get two innings out of him. And so, like, a six man, I think, leaves you too thin in the bullpen. You know, rather than sitting there saying, okay, this is what I'm going to do. Like, Paxton, you're a swing guy. 
You know, you're going to, you're going to follow Kluber, you know, Kluber, go for whatever Paxton, you know, go for, and then, you know, then whatever, maybe give Paxton an extra day rest, you know, and then maybe he piggybacks Whitlock. So Whitlock goes for Paxton goes for, you know what I mean? On the other side of it. So it's, I think you can kind of use him. And what that does is it gives you a night off in the bullpen as well. So I don't know. I, I don't think you got the horses to go a six man rotation. Maybe those other staffs are getting seven from their starters. You know what I mean? And they're like, yeah, you could do that. But man, in April, you get three or four innings from two or three guys, you are screwed. Like he's just run out of arms. And yeah. And I think that's where the conversation turns. It's like, let's be real 2022 and 2021. Partly because the roster construction, partly because of injuries. You know, the only good arms on those teams at times completely ran into the ground. John Schreiber, like fried by the end of the year. Uh, You go to 2021, like everyone forgets how good Adam Ottavino was for you in the first half. You ran him into the dirt to get by and you didn't really have a choice. Um, And now you look at it like I like Kenley Jansen. I like Chris Martin. Neither of those guys are young. They're not spring chickens at this point. Um, And we saw last year when they had arms, they were staggering arms, kind of like you mentioned there uh, with Hulk and Hill and kind of mixing and matching there instead of going, you know, a six man when it was at least possible for you. Um, So, yeah, I I think that's where they want to go. But I I agree with Lou. It feels like no matter what, if someone's even slightly not ready for that first week, they're not going to view it as a reason to rush them. Uh, And I think Cutter Crawford, some of those quadruple A arms, Josh Winkowski, They'll look at as someone, if need be, how it could move to the rotation as well. But I think they're going to lean on that depth more than trying to go six, man. I, I agree with Lou on that. That seems at least how the organization feels at this point. <laughs> Lou, yeah. Lou, there, there are what? some baseball fans out there. Yeah. Uh, some, some call them some of the more smarter Red Sox fans. Um, that have some concerns about Garrett Whitlock moving to the rotation. Some of these really smart baseball fans are like, I saw him in the, in the bullpen. He was an elite reliever. And then I saw him in the rotation and uh, not the same guy. The, uh, the strikeout rate with his slider cut in half as a starter versus a reliever. These baseball fans also incredibly incredibly good looking and i've i'm with them you know i kind of feel like you know they're making a lot of good points i want to know where you stand on the garrett whitlock to the rotation debate because just um you know for people that might be on the fence about it help help us uh understand make 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 sense of it well it's funny you should say that because i uh i'm one of those guys that would love to see garrett whitlock in the bullpen I just oh, I would. And this is <laughs> fuck Tyler, off, fuck Tyler, off, Jared, fuck you off, loser, yeah. fuck you, loser. Celebration. He started clapping. He <laughs> started clapping. Jake, please cut that no, video. No, what no, an idiot. Not. Let's let Lou finish. Let's let Lou finish, please. Yeah. Let him finish. Shut it off. <laughs> we interrupt Tyler being an absolute fucking asshole to bring you a word from our sponsor. Trades, free agency, roster cuts, baseball season feels so far away, but excitement is already building. Blue Moon gives you a dose of ballpark nostalgia without even being at the park. In fact, Blue Moon was born in a ballpark at the Sandlot Brewery in Denver, Colorado. Its bold flavor, bright explosion of color, and iconic orange slice ritual guarantee a -a one-of-a-kind beer experience year-round. Tyler, we got a big weekend coming up with the Super Bowl. Do you think you're going to have any Blue Moons during the big game? Yeah, I might have one or two blue moons during the game, but nothing crazy because I got to be up early on Monday morning to talk about how excited I am that Garrett Whitlock's going to be a starter. Awful. Just awful. From its refreshing flavor with Valencia orange peel for a subtle sweetness and hints of coriander, Blue Moon Belgian style wheat ale is a one of a kind beer that's made brighter. It's carefully crafted and full flavored with refreshing notes and a smooth, creamy finish. Why strike out with the same old beer when you can get something one of a kind? Best served with a signature orange garnish to showcase its beautiful hazy color, a beer this good only comes around once in a blue moon, but you can enjoy it all off-season long. Make winter weather feel like spring training. Blue Moon Belgian-style wheat ale is a one of a kind every time. Get Blue Moon delivered by visiting get.bluemoonbeer.com slash jared to see your delivery options. That's get.bluemoonbeer.com slash jared. Blue Moon, made brighter. Celebrate responsibly, Blue Moon Brewing Company, Golden, Colorado Ale. 
That's and, tough. And, That's tough. And it's, it's one of the things, reasons why I wanted to go get that one more starter so they could do it. I am a bullpen whore, okay? Mm. I I want when the game – in 162 ga- in a games, rather, if you're up after six, that shit's got to be done. You, you, you're not going to win every single one, but it's got to be over. And I got to feel like it's over. You know, I've been on teams where I turn around and, and look at that bullpen and be like, we're screwed. I remember in 2002, the year that Bayerga, Carlos Bayerga was on the team, me and him on the bench, every time we went to the bullpen, we would pray. He would come down and be like, and he would come down and the guy's in the bench and he would pray. He said, God, please let this bullpen be animals tonight. And then we would pray because we knew it was a freaking nightmare. <clears throat> and, and that starts wearing on you. If I could have a bullpen with Jansen and, and, and Martin and Whitlock and Hauk and Shriver and the lefties, I would sit there and say, dude, just give me the, just, Go on, go on, give me five innings, give me three runs, four runs, keep us in it. Let's try to, we'll lock this game down. That's the only reason why. I understand. Can he be a great starter? We'll see. The contract, you want him to be a starter if you're Bloom and those guys? Absolutely. I'm just a believer. I, I, I don't know. I, I've already seen it, Milliken. I've already seen it on that pen. I don't know. If he's going to be a great starter, so be it. I think moving through the rotation <laughs> last year killed that baseball team. Early in the season. Killed them. I, I 100% agree. I, I think that's the realest thing. I don't think anybody looked at 2022 like the way that team was built. That bullpen was short well before they had to pull yep. Tanner Houck out of that bullpen. And the reality was when they were looking at the bullpen, it was short, but they were saying, hey, how can Whitlock lead the way and we'll kind of go from there? That gets completely thrown out of the wrap when, you know, how has to get pushed into the rotation and everything plays out with sales injury. But for the people that are kind of complaining about Whitlock going into the rotation this year. I think I could understand the bullpen conversation a little bit more if this wasn't a bridge year, but isn't it now that it's a bridge year, it makes even more sense to understand like the big thing you want to come out of 2023 is you want to know where your kind of cornerstones are. You want to know if Brian Bayo can solidify himself in the rotation. If Garrett Whitlock can solidify himself, Tristan Casas, Yoshida and left all these different things. It makes sense now to find out if Whitlock can start, because guess what? We already saw last year where when he initially moved to the rotation and absolutely dominated the Rays, absolutely dominated the Angels. And those were some of the most you know lethal and explosive starts we saw out of any starter last year, uh, you know, before injuries popped up. And, you know, Whitlock's talking about it now saying, hey, like my two seamer wasn't even moving the way I hoped it would last year when he was dealing with that hip injury and different stuff. So, you know, I take some of that stuff back the command. I think he was learning how to go through a lineup multiple times, but if there's a time to figure out whether Whitlock can start, it's now. And he's already shown, Hey, I can go back to the bullpen and be dominant. Get your answer. Because if he can be a starter for the next, you know, duration of this extension, you need that. Cause you need to get cheap options in this rotation to kind of build you up. Cause what's been the lacking thing, true mid rotation to top rotation starters. This is the time to get an answer. No, listen, I actually, that's the best argument I've heard because as far as like find out what he is moving forward, you can always move him back. I think I just sort of live in the now and want to sit there and say they can win a lot more games this year with them out in the bullpen like they could have last year. Um, but obviously they can't now, I think, with this rotation. It's too thin. But you, that's probably the best point in that find out who he is because if you know going into 24, you got Bayo, you got Whitlock, and a little side order of sale piece, you know, hopefully he's healthy. Now it's, it's easier. It's an easier path, right, to build the team in the future. And like, that's just the thing for me. It's like, do I know if Whitlock's going to be a successful starter at this point? I don't, because there were times last year when he was struggling to get through a lineup. But let's just see him fully healthy. We saw glimpses of it. It's not like he didn't go to the rotation. And we didn't see any of it. It's just, hey, in a perfect world where you know, Xander Bogarts accepts the six year 160 or 7190 after they push another year if the Padres hadn't got crazy, where they don't rescind Nate of all these offer off the table when they realize they weren't going to go over the luxury tax anymore. It's like, OK, I could feel that because when you talk about that bullpen, anybody, I don't care if you are a Whitlock in the rotation believer. That's a beautiful thing to think about that bullpen and not even have to have a conversation about it. But 2023, like winning is important. But the more important thing for me is answering questions for beyond 2023. Mm-hmm. I think that mm-hmm. needs to be priority number one here. And it's like, hey, yeah, Daniel Bard was Daniel Bard. Listen, Daniel Bard, there was a reason why he came into pro ball. And after that initial taste of starting, they never had the conversation again. He had two pitches. Garrett Whitlock does have three true pitches. We've seen him. The reason we fell in love with Garrett Whitlock wasn't because he could go out and pitch one inning and be dominant. It was because he'd come in in the seventh inning and you wouldn't have to think about the game or, you know, against the Tigers early in last year. He goes four innings to end it and throws like 35 pitches. You're like, 
this is the easiest thing in the world. That's kind of what you're hoping for. Like it's the fact that he could go multiple innings, get an answer. Why not get the answer now when, mm-hmm. you know, let's be real. No one's sitting here expecting them to be in the World Series. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, mean, I, Good I mean, I I yeah, I mean I I I'm I'm not totally against it anymore. I think I could, just because the decision's already been made, so now I kind of have to adjust how I how I see it and how I view it. Um my whole logic last year was we saw it, but then, you know, you see it's an injury and it's like, all right, well, there's a reason why he sucked. But I still have not heard a logical explanation for the 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 drop off in uh, strikeout percentage with the slider. The slider just was not the same. Um, but like, but can't you look I, at it and you say it's like he was out there and he wasn't fully stretched out. They're trying to get him to go through a lineup multiple times. It's like, all right. I saw it when he was fresh, when he initially came to the rotation and they weren't asking him to go five or six. Well, now he has a full offseason, obviously coming off surgery, but a spring training to build up. Let's see what it looks like when Garrett Whitlock is preparing yeah. to be a starter and not preparing yeah. to you know, have his role kicked back and forth because Bloom didn't properly take care of the pitching staff before Chris Sale's injury or after. Yeah, mm-hmm. I'm just a big like, if it ain't broke, don't fix it thing. I mean, I. You know, having that conversation with Maz on the baseball hour and it's not every day that you can have an elite back end of the bullpen guy who can give you multiple innings like that versus what's the best case of him being a starter. Is he going to win a Cy Young award? Uh, is he going to go out there and give you 200 innings or uh, make 30 starts for you and have a, a sub three? And a, a strikeouts per nine north of 10 and a whip south of one. Like, is he going to be that guy? Because those guys are hard to come by. But in reality, he's probably going to be north of all that. Like, he's going to, I don't think he's going to hit the mark. Maybe he could be north of 10 strikeouts per nine as a starter. I don't know. Um, but I'll I just feel no, like. Can, yeah. Well, one thing to me, too, to, uh, Jared, too, is uh, I, I, when you watch baseball, I almost feel like, unless you've got horses like Houston had, they can sort of devaluing starters, right? Like this whole third time through the order, it's like, dude, if you give me five and give up two or three, you've done your job. And I think now more than ever, I need to lock the last four down. You know, I think more than ever, it's like almost like you're asking starters to just keep you in the game and give you five. And we're actually patting them on the back for five and die. Like that's your job. Good for you. Again, there are rotations that you've got horses. We know that, but not many of them have that. So it's like you're going to be – we're going to be ecstatic. You know, Sale and Kluber and Whitlock and these guys go five innings, one run, two runs. Like it's, like it's something. Not seven. So, it's, uh, you know, not that they completely devalue the starter, but there's so much emphasis on four innings on that bullpen, which is why I feel like it's even more important than ever, you know, to win. But I'm more into that – I guess win now as opposed to like looking ahead as far as what would luck can be. Maybe he can be that guy that can go seven for you. And then you got Ian Bale. Now all of a sudden you do have two horses. We'll see. Yeah. I, yeah. I think where I lot or I land on and it's like Lou, I agree. I think when it comes to the postseason, like we know what it is. Like look at the Astros, look at what that bullpen does for you. And obviously their rotation is extremely good, but you need yeah. bullpen arms to get through. They, like that's the you know, that's the conversation. But I think if you look at last year, Look at the 2022 Red Sox. What happens when you don't have guys who can eat innings, when you don't have those mid rotation guys that can get you through the game's over before it even starts. You know, you're in the third inning. And when you have guys, whether they're coming out with injury or they're just extremely mediocre or not good, you're out of those games before they start. And ultimately, like, it's great to have that elite reliever who can give, you know, 60 innings and call it a two five ERA, whatever it may be. But if I can look at Garrett Whitlock and he can give me 150 to 170 innings a year and it's something like a three five to a three six, <clears throat> that has more value. Ultimately, that's way more innings. And Alex Kors had that same conversation. That's been the point. It's like, do I want 60 innings of Garrett Whitlock? And especially when you look at team build, right? Like we're looking at a team here who's the strength is their bullpen. When we're talking about the questions with the 2023 Red Sox, it's the rotation. So, yeah, maybe in a couple of years when the bullpen, you know, Martin's gone and Jansen's gone and you have holes out there, it's a real conversation. But I think when you're looking and saying the holes are in the rotation currently, it's like, all right, well, you have a guy who has the ability to step in and potentially be a mid rotation guy. If he's Mr. If he's Nick Pavetta and it's like, hey, you're barely, you know, you're going five innings, six innings and three runs, whatever it may be. And it's a four or five. It's like, no. All right. right, Then we have a different conversation. But I think we all saw in those early starts. There's more there. It's just. 
Did he struggle because teams started to see him multiple times and they realize, hey, like Whitlock, sometimes when he gets in jams, he starts pitching to contact and, you know, you can, can get out of some jams like that out of the bullpen. Or was it the stuff decreased because he wasn't fully healthy? I think that's just the answer they need. Yeah. Really? Lou, how concerned are you about the Red Sox outfield defense? Well, um, now you're talking like you, that's the thing about Masi Yoshida. It's interesting because um, you see some of the projections for this guy. Like the projections are rookie of the year, right? Like some yeah, they get him in like a four win player. I mean, it's like, it's ridiculous, but we, it's funny because he's not a great defender. Adam Duvall, I think is uh, a concern somewhat. I mean, I don't know. I guess the left field, right field, like, you know, the war. You're, you're the more concerned metrics. about him defensively than offensively? Well, I think overall right now, like this is the guy. Adam Duvall. He can, he can play center. He can play center. The, but it's like the Red Sox in a nutshell. Like, I don't know if he's going to hit 200, you know, or if he's going to hit 260 and give me a Renfro here. Like, I have no idea what I'm going to get from him offensively. So defensively, you're right. He can play center, but can he play at a level of like a Jackie? Can he play at a level of a Kike? Because now you've got poor defense on your left and you've got Verdugo who needs to step up and just be a player that everybody thought. I thought it was interesting in the year. And they're like, who needs to step up? Core is like Verdugo. I'm like, dude, you just named him. Like he could have very easily said there's a lot of guys. Instead, he named him. So they want him to be more athletic. They want him to play faster. So he's going to be a key to that defense, obviously, in right field. Mm. You know, but yeah, you don't you don't have Jackie. You know, you don't have, you know, Kike out in center field running some stuff down. So there's a concern, but I'll take the offensive upside over that crap he had last year. Yeah. I Alex is not afraid to to call out his guys. Like I remember he used to he used to call a Mookie sometimes. Ben like in 18, he's like, yeah, he's like, we need the we need the right fielder to to start hitting a little bit, and it's yeah. like that's just, I mean, that, that's that's kind of how you create an environment where no one walks around like they've got like a fucking twelve inch dick. Where it's like, yeah, it, clearly he won the MVP that year. He got called out by his manager. Yeah, we need this guy to step up. Like if he yeah. starts hitting, everyone's gonna everyone's gonna eat. Um, but I guess like with like the projections for Yoshida and everything. Uh, did you think that any of it was a little overzealous because you've seen guys come from, and I, and I hate when, uh, you know, players that come from Japan get compared to other players that come from Japan. And my thought process, when that happens, when it's like, uh, if, a, if a player comes from Japan yeah, and everyone's like, well, well, this player sucked and he's from Japan. It's like, okay, what if let's just say, uh, Mike Trout. Or, or if if I came from America to play in Japan and they're like, that guy sucks. Why would Mike Trout be good? He's from America, too. <laughs> like, I, just, I never understood why yeah. they were like, well, this guy sucks from Japan. So all players suck from Japan. It's just a very ignorant statement. And I'm I'm kind of, I mean, like no one is more educated on this than anyone else. Looking at the projections, do you think that any of it was like, oh, that seems a little, you know, gung ho? I think a lot of it seemed high to me just because, again, I want to see it first. You know, um, I agree with you. I mean, I, I played in Japan, you know, in 2000. And people are like, it's like three, it's like triple A baseball. I'm like, no, it's not. Like, it's good freaking players. What they lack is power. You know what I mean? So, I mean, it's, it's, it's some of the best breaking ball splits I've ever seen. Defensively, there are freaking gold gloves all over the place. And those guys put the bat in the ball. The swings might look a little strange. Like even you know a guy like Ichiro is the first first time you see Ichiro you say oh just throw him a changeup away he sink her down and then he can't touch it and then he takes that shit to left center and laces it and you're like how does the barrel stay in the zone that's what they do I mean so for me the biggest question is can he handle velocity like that to me is the biggest question of a lot of the Japanese players that come over here can they handle velocity top of the zone I saw the other day the scouting department and that was one of the things they focused on on Yoshida and watched him the last couple of years. Watching him against high velocity guys out there, they say he can handle it. If he can handle it, then I think you finally have a leadoff hitter, which might actually set the table, which is something you haven't had in how many years? You know, so that, that part of it's uh, exciting. I've, Again, like your outfield last year had 20 home runs, your starting outfield, Verdugo, Kike, and Jackie. You know, one of these two, one of these three guys should be able to hit 20 home runs. You know, so I'll take that offense if I had to give up a little bit of that defense. It, and just for like the Yoshida stuff, like a lot of people have been kind of talking about the velocity. It's like, can he do it? And that's, you yeah. know, guys like Shogo Akiyama who just couldn't figure it out when they got here and they were just getting right. blown again and again. You dive into it. They, you know, Fangraphs kind of dives into the scouting report a little bit. 
Against fastballs, 93 miles per hour and up, he was 273, 333, 455, 788. You go 95 and up, it was 296, 345, 370, 715. So obviously the power doesn't carry as much, but you know he's still almost batting 300 against 95 and up. Is yeah. it a large sample size? Hell no, because the majority of those guys aren't throwing that. But I think that's the stuff they're banking on there. I think what's a little interesting going off the Duval stuff, Lou, that you brought up is I do think the center field defense, I don't think he's going to be out there, you know, I bet it's like four times a week, four to five times a week, because I was looking at some of Brian Snicker's comments and we talked about it, Jared, when we went back, you know, Duval was horrendous in April and May last year before he got hurt with the wrist injury. He got so hot in June. He was on fire, hitting everything. Well, Snicker said he was having a hard time body wise holding up playing center field every day. He felt heavy out there. And once they started to give him a little bit of the breather between the corners and a break, that's where things changed. I think once Mondesi gets healthy or if he's ready by opening day in Arroyo, I think we're going to see a little bit more of Kike out in center. You know, I think it'll be shortstop primarily, but I think they're going to be very careful with how they use Duvall and maybe they take a break and they do it with Verdugo as well. But you play that weird game where it's like, you're probably going to have a well below, you know, Yoshida's defense. Everyone craps on it. I haven't heard much positivity there. You got Duvall, who's, you know, hopefully average in center field. And for Dugo, who got, you know, he was all right in right field to the eye test, but the metrics hated him out there. Yeah, see, the, I agree with you, but that's where Tyler, like I start talking about like building a roster type thing. And, and you're sitting there saying, oh, you trade for Mondesi. He's not ready to start the season. He's never really been healthy his whole career. We don't really know what he is. Why not just go get Jose Iglesias? You know, why, why not just get Iggy and just say, you know what? He's our shortstop. Kike's our second baseman. Arroyo's our utility guy. Kike can give Duval a blow at three times a week in center field. Arroyo can slide in at second base. And, like, you've got more constant vers- you got versatility that you can kind of count on. You know what I mean? Like, instead, it's, it's, it's like Mondesi's here. He's not ready for the season. I question the depth they have at the middle of the infield, not just the big league level. You tell me, like, and you know, I've talked to a lot of people at the minor league level. Like, who's the shortstop at AAA? You know, is it, who's the second baseman at AAA? Like, what if Kike gets hurt or Royo gets hurt before Mondesi comes back? You know what I mean? So that's like that's my concern. Like, position wise, I feel like your two biggest health concerns are short and second, and the backup is already hurt. It, it, and like that's the scary part. And I do wonder, like the Sox are at 224 right now. Uh, so they have about nine million before they hit the luxury tax. We know they're not going to go over. Are they hoping Jose Iglesias or Elvis Andrews kind of fall in their lap? And, you know, we're talking about it six days and they can put Trevor Story on the 60 day IL and say, yeah. hey, here's a free 40 man spot. We don't have to deal with another Franklin Herman situation or, you know, name all the arms that have been DFA'd so far. Can we get someone to fall in and we don't have to give up somebody else and play yeah. it that way? But Lou, like I, I can't agree more with what you're saying because like you're saying Christian Arroyo and Kike Hernandez, if Aldo Berto Montesi isn't healthy, neither of those guys are ever healthy. So we're talking Emmanuel Valdez, who, you know, plays second base barely, like, you know, and has to prove himself. He struggled when he came over to the system after he mashed with the Astros and then Nico Goodrum. Yeah. yeah. yeah another guy who, you know, fringy quadruple A guy, ultimately. And I think that's why it's like, if you can just give me someone to depend on, and we know, I think McCaffrey had it a couple days ago, they're looking for a middle infielder. Elvis Andrews seems unlikely to me at this point, but if you can go get Jose Iglesias, just take, sometimes the easy answer is all it takes. Like, I remember last year when I was bitching and bitching about the bullpen, it's like, Brad Boxberger was out there for friggin' $3 million, and you could have had another late inning arm on your staff just so you didn't have to play all these games and start, you know, fucking up people's roles and, you know, be so low on arms. Sometimes it's easy, and it's like you were a couple million over the luxury tax at that time. $3 million is going to do something to you? Hell no, because when you go over the luxury tax, you're trying to win a championship. Now it's like, yeah, you got $9 million. You should spend pretty close up to it. Why not? Jose Iglesias, I think he was $5 million last year. What He's sitting here at... Yeah. There's a few of those spots too, like Roberto Perez, right? They tried to get him, and it's like uh, I'm in the same spot with the catchers. Maybe they feel like Reese and Wong are good enough. You know, I don't know who the guy is in AAA. You know, could you Roberto Perez moves Wong to AAA? Not that I ever want to send a guy down because I've lived that life, but as an organization building the team, I feel a lot better about that. Now I've got depth. Like, who's the AAA catcher? Who's the AAA middle infielder? You know, like those, that's the depth and people don't think about that, but, um, 
the depth at some of the questionable positions is a concern. Yeah, and like it's like what Jorge Alfaro, who's going to be with Colombia for the WBC. So it's like maybe he factors into that catching conversation. But like you know, at the end of the day, if I told you Reese McGuire didn't hit this year, and I told you Connor Wong didn't hit this year, would anyone look at you crazy? No, they wouldn't. They'd be like, all right, well, those guys kind of are what many people thought they were. You're yeah. just hoping for them to be replacement level, and that's great when your team is taken care of in so many other spots. Replacement level, or even a little bit below that, doesn't work when you have other places that you're hoping for replacement level to get by. Yeah, I'll say this. I think uh, a lot of people in the organization are very high on Connor Wong. You know, what he can become, the way he handles the pitching staff, the way he throws, and can that, that swing started to develop a little bit. But it's just like Alfaro, he swings, he got pop, he swings and misses a lot. And I don't really think he catches. I, I'm not really yeah. sure he's a he, catcher. Yeah, he's weak behind the plate, like good arm, but doesn't throw anybody out. You know what I mean? Like, it's great to have a nice pop time, but if you're not nailing anyone, what's that going to do for you at the end of the day? Yeah, yeah. I, I was excited about the signing, but it was mostly for the depth because I just I didn't want to go into I didn't want to go into the season with Reese McGuire and Connor Wong being your guaranteed one and two. You're going to divvy that up somehow and you're locked into that. At least with Alfaro, you have options. How do you see the playing time being divvied up between I guess you can include I was going to say between Wong and, and McGuire, but I, you can include Alfaro, too, if you think he's going to factor in. Who do you think is going to be taking a majority of the time behind the plate? I'm not so sure Alfaro is going to be behind the dish too much. You know, like I, I, I don't. And maybe there's some, you know, bat off the bench, like third catcher, uh, DH. Maybe there's a spot for him on this bench with the extra guy. Uh, I would think it's kind of like McGuire to start, you know, with the hope that maybe Connor Wong could turn into something. You know, so I would I would think that that's kind of like where they're at right now. Like McGuire gets most of the starts and early in the year, and hopefully Wong could take take over. We'll see. I mean, that's maybe a big ask for for him, but I think that's kind of your your situation right now. Doesn't it feel like the payroll should be much lower? Like we're we're talking about being <laughs> at nine million, almost at the luxury tax. You're you're nine million away, so you've basically just call it. You've reached the luxury tax and you look around yeah. this roster and you're like, this payroll should be $95 million. <laughs> like some well, of the, like the two catchers that you got and like, obviously like no disrespect to Kike, but he's not making a ton of money. Uh, you, for a second there, you were talking about Christian Arroyo, maybe being your opening day, second baseman. Uh, you, your, your opening day, first baseman is, is making pennies. Like where the fuck is all this money being spent? Why? <laughs> I, I don't get it. Yeah, listen, yeah, I, I agree with you, Tyler. You can jump in here as well, but and it's not even like uh, Devers' contract kicks in, right? He's still sitting no. at seventeen and a half million dollars, and, and it's almost like when you look at this deal, this this payroll, you sit there and say, "Oh, they're still eating like twenty million dollars. They're still paying for Price and Pedroia, but those days are over too, right?" So it's like it's sale. He's at twenty five million as far as the luxury tax goes. Um, Story. Yeah, Trevor Story, he's on the IL as well. So it's, I agree. It, it sort of has like a 175, 185 feel to it, right? And it's sitting at what, what about two and a quarter right now. Uh, and I think where a lot of that comes in, and it's like when people talk about Dombrowski's situation with the farm system, I think a lot of people take it and it's like, Dombrowski was a great talent evaluator. And listen, even that, I, I hate using that because ultimately a lot of the scouting and the front office that's working with the drafting and everything, it really wasn't much different under Dombrowski. There hasn't been much turnover in that you know, side of things. Crockett's still leading the way on a lot of that. Um, but I think the gap there is you haven't had a lot of players really in the last three to four years that came in and solidified themselves. You know, if Jaron Duran was out here and he had solidified himself as one of those guys like, all right, well, now I'm not paying Adam Duvall seven million to go play center field. You have a lot of guys that are, you know, late in ARB. You have a bullpen where you know, you're spending real money on Kenley Jansen and Chris Martin. And ultimately, like, is that really what Bloom wants to do? No, it's not what Bloom wants to do. He wants to be cheap on the bullpen. The idea is to find those guys and kind of make it happen, but it didn't happen. So that's where I think a lot of that money is. And yeah, yeah. Trevor Story, like you lose Trevor Story, 23 million. Chris Sale, like it sucks. Yeah, 25 million. It'd be nice if that 25 million was towards a guy you still viewed as an ace, you know, someone... It'd be nice if that was Kevin Gosman, who you never dared to even give a phone call a couple of years ago. And you could say, hey, like he has a chance to go win a Cy Young for us this year and give us, you know, 150 to 180 innings or whatever. 
that's where the gap is. You haven't had as many players kind of assert themselves and take over. There was kind of that missing link. And even now, if you look at the strength of the Red Sox system, it's it's in it's like high A. You know what I mean? Like we're we're talking about Greenville. We're talking about Marcel Meyer and Mikey Romero and all those guys. That's where the strength of the system is. They really haven't had those waves come through yet where, you know, you can plug in a bunch of guys that are making absolutely nothing and not mm-hmm. have to think twice about it. Yep. You know, if Bobby Delbeck had established himself, like that's another guy that you don't have to think about that much, you know? Yeah. It's fucked up. Yeah, kind of is. That, that's one of the things, too. You talk about the system. Everybody talks about the system, you know, like, oh, keep on the 23rd. I don't know if they're that low. So oh. when, you start, when you start graduating Bayo and Casas off of this prospect list, you know, and everyone, you know, they talk about Miguel Blaze, another one, right, down in what used to pretty much Gulf Coast, whatever they call it now. He'll be in A-ball. So everything's down low. I mean, Rafael is the one guy that's up there. And there's kind of mixed reviews of what the upside is with him offensively, what he could be. You know, is he is he Mookie Betts or is he Kike Hernandez? You know what I mean? So it's like, and everyone's got him so highly ranked that it's, I, I don't know. So it's like, yeah. after this year, if some of those kids at A-ball don't step up, where does this ranking go? Who's ready to come up to the big leagues that you said give you some relief on the salary? And that's the tough part. And like, I agree with you on the Rafaela stuff. People call me a Rafaela hater. I'm not. But ultimately, he swings a lot of pitches out of the zone and he makes weak contact. It's nice that his mechanics look like Mookie. Congrats. You can match anybody's mechanics you want. That doesn't mean that's who you are. Mm -hmm. Uh, And he plays as beautiful a center field as I've seen anybody. You know, it is truly elite of the elite. Um, But that's the spot they're in. The one thing, Keith Law, 23rd, spare me on that. Seriously. He ranked them 20th last year. They were 11th. They were 11th by Baseball America and MLB Pipeline midseason. Fangraphs had him at nine at the end of the year. Now, listen, when you graduate Brian Bayo, who was a top 25 prospect in the game, well, what do you think? You know, that's taking away Jaron Duran. Jaron Duran was on top 100 list still at the end of last year. He was top five in your system. Say what you want about him. He graduated. Uh, Winkowski was top 13. Crawford was top 16. So like when you pull these pieces away, it comes with a cost ultimately. Um, but yeah, 23rd Keith Law stop. And of course, it's, yeah, you know, me. one spot above Dave Nabrowski uh, just to push that narrative all the way through. But Kylie <laughs> McDaniel had three guys. Three guys in his top 100, and he put the Red Sox at 14 on his list. And yeah. at the same time, Keith Law has Sedan Raphael as like a top 40 prospect in the sport. Stop, please. please. I, I'm please. as much of a homer prospect guy as you'll find. That yeah, is not was. where Raphael is supposed to be. Yeah. And, to, and to your right. point, Tyler, uh, everyone compared my mechanics to Scott Williamson. Never became Scott Williamson. <laughs> I, I see more Manny Ramirez with you, Jared. Well, I mean, like my swing is absolutely Manny Ramirez is a swing, but my pitching mechanics were 100% Scott Williamson. I don't know why that's the dude that I modeled my game after, but I just fucking loved him. Dude, I saw you hit it win a weekend, hit that little sponge ball, whatever, over the green monster, dude. Looked yeah, like people were, to me. I mean, I don't again, know. People, people were accusing me of uh, performance-enhancing <laughs> drugs at winter weekend, and it's like, bro, like, it just is what it is. Like, some people just have a gift, and I have that gift. By the way, I got a message um, I mean, I guess I could say it publicly, or maybe I won't say it just because I won't do free advertising. Um, but there is a uh, a very prominent, let's call it baseball company, um, that messaged me, a player development company, and they mm-hmm. heard me talking about how I want to put a batting cage slash pitching tunnel in my attic, and they said, "Let us know if you have any interest in our new product." that tracks pitching and hitting on one device would love to hook it up. So I was telling Lou about all the different Ooh. features in my house before we went on the air. And I forgot to mention, by the way, my attic is going to be a state of the art, like baseball training facility. <laughs> <laughs> what? Why? Who are you going to train yourself? Yeah. Well, I'm just going to, I'm just going to go up there and like fucking take some hacks, throw off the bump. Okay. The dream, the dream doesn't die. I mean, I'm still in phenomenal physical condition, and I'm yeah. still at a playing age. I feel like you know, thirty. I'm going into my age thirty four season. Uh, a lot of guys play into their mid to late late thirties. You know what you need? Because I I did it actually this year for the first time since like 2011. What you ever done fantasy camp? 
No, oh, but that, I, was that below you? Was that, no, was that I would love you? to, I would love to do fantasy camp. I almost did the athletics fantasy camp because of Dallas who I yeah. forgot, by the way, you know what? This is, this is a perfect opportunity to do this because I don't know how it came up, but Loomer Loney and Dallas Braden were teammates Believe in it. triple a loved them. I went back and looked at that roster that that roster, the players that played for that team that year that you guys were there, that team oh, yeah. would have won 115 games. Yeah, no, we, we it was it was the Sacramento River Kings, River Cats. We won the whole damn thing. That was my last year. No shit, I you was did. Done. I was like freaking uh, Crash Davis on that squad. What Especially year was that? 2007. Oh uh, seven, yeah, my last year. Yeah, it's a good time. I'm going to look at that roster and read off some names. It is outrageous. The the names that are on this team. Uh, Andrew Bailey, Derek. These are just like, I'm just going to name like the names that obviously are familiar to me. Uh, Andrew Bailey, who won rookie of the year, correct? Yep. Yep. Derek Barton, Jerry Blevins, uh, Dallas Braden through a perfect game. Milton Bradley, uh, Travis Buck. Um, Missing a big one. Rich Harden, Derek, Derek Bobby Martin. Kelty, uh, Mark Kotze, who's the manager of the team now, Esteban Loiza, Colby Lewis, uh, what else? Lou Maloney, right there. Uh, Mike Piazza played some <laughs> games that year. Hall of Famer. Um, Kurt, Suzuki. Kurt Suzuki, Houston Street. Yeah. yeah. A lot of, some of those Brad guys Ziegler. Yeah. Yeah. Jason Ziggy. Windsor. Yeah. Jesus. Ziggy was legit. We had Ziggy and Blevins, dude. Right side, left side. You know, it was, uh, no, it, a lot of some of those guys, obviously big league rehab, but um, that was a, that was a good time in Sacktown. I had a lot of fun <laughs> with that squizzy. That yeah. was nice. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't, uh, I forget, like you and I, you and I were doing something and, it had to have been within the last five years because Dallas was like, oh, fuck, like, tell Lou I said what's up. I was like, how the fuck do you know who Lou is? Yeah. He's like, yeah, we play together in Sacramento River Cats 2007. That was this year, man, when Suzuki, I remember like, getting pulled off the field, right, when he retired at the end of this year. I was like, shit, I think this is like the last guy, like him and uh, Struble Cabrera. Is he still playing? He was another one I played with, mm-hmm. you know, like my last year or two in the minor leagues. But yeah, Suzuki was great. I, it was funny when... He was like real young, like he was on his way up. It was like his first year in AAA. They loved him. And we were in Colorado Springs, and they, 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 we had a bad thing with them, and they drilled a couple guys. And we went out there next inning, and they, you know he's out there fastball away. And I remember like in the dugout, I was like, "What the fuck are you doing?" And he's just like, "What, what, what?" And I was just like, "We're getting dropped left and right. Inner half, put something in an elbow. Just do it right, you know." And it was, <laughs> He's it was kind of fucked up back then. No, and he's been an unbelievable career. One of the nicest guys I ever met. I'm so happy for him. And it was actually it was hard to watch him walk off the field because I care about the guy. He's a, he's a good man, a good family. Suzuki, good dude. Kurt Suzuki. Yeah, yeah he Brady's uh, nuts. Brady's. Well, 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 give me the area code again. I don't know. Is it two one five? What the hell is it? Stockton is two oh nine. The two oh nine. He had the two oh nine tattoo. He had the two oh nine in his glove. He had the two oh nine in his hat. Yeah. I was just like, look at this freaking guy with his 209. All you got to do He's is ask him what area code he, he lives in. And he has 209 tattooed across uh, his like abs. Everywhere. Yeah, it's 209. Everywhere you look, it was 209. I think I had it on his freaking spikes too. I, I, I've, proud, never met, I've never met someone more proud to be part or, or be from like the worst part of the country. <laughs> Like Stockton is a piece of shit. You're from Saugus. <laughs> Saugus is a someplace special is our tagline. I don't think anyone is calling Stockton special. Not one person. There, I, I told you I, I, I had to do. I lost a bet to Dallas in like 2019. I had to do an essay on Stockton and I enjoyed it because I just got to talk about these are all just like facts that I researched it. They're like the third most illiterate like town or city in the country. They're like the second most obese. (laughs) They're just fat idiots. Yeah. 
They're oh, fat idiots. I think Bray's <laughs> one of the few guys that calls me Loomer. I don't know why. Loomer. I get that once in a while. People actually at one point thought my last name was just Loney. <laughs> and their name was Loomer. Like James Loney? I, I don't know. I guess so. I don't know. But yeah, Loomer still, Loney. <laughs> every, time I, every time I talk to him, like, he comes on the show once in a while. He's, he's just like, Loomer, what's going on? Like, looks at, looks at your dope. driver's license. What's Loomer? Up, Mr. Loney? Yeah. Loomer Loney? Yeah, Loney. Hey, Mr. Loney, how you doing? Jesus. Yeah, it's all right. He's a good dude, man. Funny um, bastard. Do you, do you find yourself welcoming, because we were talking about this earlier, about how people yeah. uh, didn't know about the Pablo Sandoval thing. A lot of people for the first time probably just heard Steve from Weymouth, and they were like, what the fuck was that? That was 2017, yeah. I want to say. Uh, are you embracing kind of trying to put yourself in front of a brand new audience that doesn't know who Loomer Loney is. Like they don't know, <laughs> they don't remember you playing. They, right. they're, you're going to, you're only apparently you're almost four years away from people not even knowing that you did sports talk radio. Like you will enter a chapter of your life, kind of like Dennis Eckersley where there so many people don't know that he fucking played major league baseball. They were just like, yeah, like yeah. The, that's the Nesson guy. You're entering yeah. that new chapter. Are you going to, welcome the challenge of i mean you know you know kids and their attention spans as yeah. a, a man in your 40s being like hey like this is baseball we need to get the younger audience and how will you plan on doing that yeah yeah uh, yeah i mean i am I'm embracing that it, i still i feel like that now like it went from when i played people recognized you now when i went radio people never recognized me they recognized my voice so it's like you know and, and it got to the point where, like, people on the radio who listened to me didn't even know I played. You know what I mean? First off, because we didn't really talk much baseball, you know? And it was like, so it's sort of the way it's been going here. So now all of a sudden you're back into the booth again. And, yeah, I don't expect people, everybody to know the hell I am, which is fine with me, you know? And so they get this, I get the start over kind of thing. Like, it's just like a fresh start. Like, this is what I do. I call games. And hopefully you enjoy it and hopefully you're entertained and we go from here. So I'm all for that. I'm all for like a fresh start and kind of reintroducing myself to whoever young player. I mean, all my buddies, they, they, you know, people my kid plays with, the kids have no idea the hell I am. You know, none of them. They're too young. So I'm cool with it. So, Lou, I'm like, I'm a nerd. Obviously, I do analytics and a lot of that stuff. I think what I like about you is not that you're a big analytics guy, but you just you don't piss on it. Like you're willing to take it into account, but you know it's not it's obviously not everything, and I don't think it should be. Right. I think you need to use analytics and the old school like you played, so that's a whole nother you know tool in your tool belt. Now that you have more of this time to prep and kind of approach it differently, you're not spending hours on the Patriots, the Celtics, whatever it may be. Is that something you're hoping to like kind of connect with a little bit more or? Like, you know, just get more familiar with it. Like, how do you kind of view that when you come, when it comes to broadcast? Yeah, I think a lot of it is really valuable. I think a lot of it is valuable in kind of evaluating, um, maybe looking deeper into numbers, you know, like so-and-so, uh, this guy, he sucked the last month. Oh, actually, you know, because I've had those months where I've actually felt good at the plate and I got nothing. You know what I mean? And I'm like, I think I'm, I'm doing my job. I'm just not getting any hits or I'm getting hits and I'm just lucky as hell. Like, they're just broken bats all over the place. So I think it can, it can describe what a player's doing, regardless of what the numbers might show you. But somebody recently told me, like, just kind of be yourself. Don't be Stat Masterson. Mm -hmm. So it was just like, you know, it was just like, don't let it become all of it. You know, and, and if you want to sprinkle some of it in, um, then that's fine to kind of explain some of the things. So I'm all about it. I, I like analytics. I think the problem with analytics is that we don't have a middleman. You know, to be honest with you, like, that's the biggest problem. Like, these, these numbers mean something, you know, and obviously you can learn from them. But you've got people that can't communicate them to baseball players, so they truly understand how they can use them. So the players are like, I don't even know what the hell you're talking about. I, I, I'm not doing that. What, is, what does that even mean? So I think that's, like, the area. The people that use analytics, to me, are good communicators to get into the baseball players or the manager that grew up a game a certain way and you're telling them to play a different way, you know, like that, that's hard to swallow. So, but I'm all for it. I think some of the numbers are good. I think some of the numbers are sort of like, you know, whatever, but, um, it's going to be part of it, but I'm not going to sit there and just start regurgitating numbers all day long either. Yeah. I, I thought that was one of the things that stuck out. Like Middleburks did a really good job of that when he had his, you know, shot pregame, postgame in the booth or whatever. 
Um, but you know, we look at we did the Matt Barnes interview last episode, and he starts talking yeah. what Heim told him about why he was the DFA choice, and it's like he, I don't even understand what he was trying to communicate to me. And you know, that's why you need someone like Alex Cora who can be that middle guy. Jason Veritek seems to have yeah. really grown in that role. Will Venable was like seemed to be pretty important to that process as well. Uh, but like that's the disconnect. It's to get people to get it and. You know, I look at it, it's the same people who's told you, you know, Brian Bayo was complete garbage because of what his ERA was at the end of the year. It's like the dude was getting babbit to death, like so many grounders and little, you know, tappers over shortstop got in. And it's like, dude, he was one of the most unluckiest pitchers in the entire sport from the moment he debuted for Dugo early in the year. Like anyone who watched April saw he was tearing the cover off the ball, but it was in someone's mitt every single time. I think that's some of the stuff it's like where you're talking that radio world, the radio and the 85 year old man who you know, hates analytics. He's going to shit on it every time you find that middle ground. That's how you connect with the younger audience and, you know, my generation and down. Yeah. Yeah. But I think there's a place for it. I think, I just don't think people want to be overwhelmed, you know, with it as well. Just try to find, yeah, try to find the placement of it and how to kind of, you know, introduce it, not confuse people, try to just kind of speak to both sides. This is, this is a thought that I've had for a while now. Uh, my theory on sports radio in Boston. And you have this Patriots reign of terror for 20 years. And obviously, football is king. The NFL is king. They own a day of the week and all that. Yep. But you look around these shows on both stations. And basically, aside from you at the time, both stations hired football guys whose job it was to maybe know a little bit of other sports. Do you think that that'll ever change? Like, do you think that we'll ever get back to a point where maybe baseball isn't like, you know, I, I, football is what it is. Like, it's, it's probably always going to be number one at this point. Um, but do you think we'll ever get back to a point where, because I told you and, and Mutt knows this as well, like Mutt Merloni was my favorite show. Because you guys talked about baseball all the time. Yeah. And I would I would tweet into the show. I worked at a fucking uh, fake chewing tobacco place. So it was just putting labels on tin cans and scooping up the fucking dip and putting it in cans. And we would just sit there and I would listen to Mutt Merloni every single day. And I would tweet into the show and Mutt would read my tweets. And that was like a very baseball centric show. Do you think that we'll ever get a baseball first show in sports radio again in this market you know i i i'm not so sure about that but i think what you'll do is you'll start demanding like football people actually paying attention to the other sports you know more right because i i do believe that it's the most delusional fan base is like patriots fans at this point just because a lot of these people that's all they've ever known like their, their entire life has been 20 years of success and think it's always going to be there, think it's always going to be popular, think it's always going to be number one. And, and maybe it is. I don't know. But, you know, it, to me, it's if the Patriots have another couple years, the way they've had the last two or three or three or four or five more years, and it is a possibility, people mow their lawn in September. You know, they will just go out and spend time with their family and not watch a Patriots game. Like, it's not, you're watching because it was freaking Tom Brady and Bill Belichick and winning Super Bowls. Like, people in Boston are sports fans. <laughs> like, I always try to sit there and say, if you're a Patriots fan, you love the Celtics, the Bruins, and the Red Sox. If you're a Bruins fan, you love all other ones. So, it's like, don't shit. If you're just talking one sport, you're actually shitting on the people because they want to hear about everything. You know what I mean? And it's just, but the numbers show football talk, like just it rules. It just, it just does. It's just constant. It's 12 months a year. They own the entire year. Like it rules, but you're going to have to start addressing it because of this football team, they're not going to be what they've always been. Regardless of whether people think that's, you know, that's not going to be true or not. It's just not going to happen. So eventually the Red Sox will come back or eventually the Bruins, have, you know, they have their run. The Celtics are on a nice little run right now. It's just the way it is. And we, we root for teams that, that win, right? Teams that are interesting. So the Red Sox go on a nice little run for five or six, eight years. Back in like 05, 06, 07, every radio station was trying to find baseball guys because of what was going on in 03, 04, 07. You know what I mean? 
Now it's like, no, whatever. Give me a football guy. Find me a football guy, which is fine. You know, but I think you got to start paying attention to other sports. Yeah. I, I just, I don't know. I, it, I, it's crazy to me that we're now at the 10 year reunion of the 2013 team because yeah. for me, it doesn't seem like it was that long ago. Like listening to, to you and Mutt talking baseball and just being able to tune into a four hour radio show every day, knowing that I was going to get drowned in Red Sox Sam. talk. Mm-hmm. Fucking Tyler. <laughs> <laughs> was my mic not muted? No, no, no it is not. No, I'm so sorry. <laughs> right my is that your dog? No, she's barking way too much. All right. Damn, she's <laughs> fighting. Continue. I'm sorry. Um, all right, it's like it doesn't feel like we're ten years removed from a baseball centric sports radio show. Like it just doesn't feel like that. But now that we are kind of where we are right now, it it doesn't feel like we're going to we're anywhere closer to having something like that ever no. again. Like that might've been it. Like that might've been it just because um, I think that radio stations have seen what football talk does for the the bottom line. Yeah. And it's like, well, you know, that's what it is. Like that's what, that's what keeps the lights on. That's what keeps people listening and calling. So, you know, you can be passionate about baseball all you want, but we're going to talk football. And like that it also- sucks. It's all it's also weird because like, you know, obviously the the interest has dipped a little bit with the team not being good, but like growing up, I felt like part of the identity of Boston itself was just like standing by the Red Sox whether or not they were bad or good. And like that like part of the identity was like, yeah, they're usually bad, but we still love them anyway. And now that part of the identity has been lost. And I I I like that makes me feel like a little sad even though it's because We've gotten that taste of winning and and now it's sort of like maybe we're spoiled and we only pay attention to the good teams. But I did miss when like part of the city's culture was standing by the Red Sox, whether or not they were horrible or embarrassing or whatever, just standing by them through the thick and thin. Like that was part of the identity for me growing up. That's like part of the delusion, though. No one more than the Patriots Bobos want to throw the Red Sox, you know, not being great in their face. It's like you guys realize you're picking 14th just like the Red Sox are in the draft, right? Like your team was just as mediocre and hard to watch as the Red Sox were. And like I go back to 2021 and Lou, you can probably speak to this way better than me because I've only been in the industry a couple of years. But when we got to the postseason in 2021, even at the sports hub, you know, Patriots, Celtics, Bruins, whatever it may be, we were doing basically four hours on the Red Sox when you got to the playoff run. It's like if the, when you get to the playoffs, the interest is there. You see that it can come out. It's just maintaining that and you got to care you got to care enough to put that time in to make it come to the top but it's possible I, I think when you see if the red sox and i think some of it's been the ups and downs that have played a part of it as well but we saw what this city and what this fan base is capable of in 2021 and i think there were a lot of people who wanted to act like that wasn't possible anymore it is it is there it's just you know it takes both sides the team has to be good the fans have to care, but also the people making the shows have to care. That's what hurt last year the most, actually, was what you saw in October of 2021 was like just, it was ridiculous. I mean, it was, it was ridiculous. I've never seen that before. I've never, I've never been to Fenway when it's been that loud, that party atmosphere, what the grandstands were doing. Like it was, I mean, it wasn't like that in 13. I don't think it was like that in 18, you know, maybe in 04 because it was so freaking new, but 2021 was, was, was another level. And it was like, okay, here we go. We got this interest. Let's go. Let's parlay that into like a nice off season and, you know, make a run at this thing, you know, maybe, maybe one last turn and, and it just didn't work out. But that 2021 run was something that we haven't seen here in a long, long time, which made you feel like it's there to your point, Tyler. Like it's there. Just, you got to find it again though. Right. But you, it's about winning. You got to win and get back there. It's, and I, and I think that's what hurt so much about 2022 is like, yeah. and I, I think the Red Sox where they were like, they felt like there was a window opening and, you know, they fumbled that bag partially with Bogarts and that, you know, changed the timeline, obviously, and they had to reschedule their plans. And you know, now it's a bridgey or whatever it may be. But you were you kind of had Boston in your hand for a second. You know, the Patriots, they were good, but, you know, and the Celtics obviously get into the finals, but it felt like the Red Sox were at least right in that conversation to kind of compete with football you know you'll never overtake it at this point no. but now it's like you see one bad year and now you're kicked at the bottom because you know the Patriots are the Patriots the Celtics are great the Bruins yeah. are great and you're kind of like where you were in 2021 it reminds me but that's where it is and I think it circles back this whole conversation it feels very 2021 right now 
where, hey, if everything goes right and everyone stays healthy, like the beginning of the you know first three months of 2021, where they were winning all these crazy games, you know, they had a good start in April outside of the Orioles series to begin the year. You need that kind of start. But even when they were that good, it's like no one cared about the 2021 Red Sox until they started sucking in August. The playoff run got crazy and it lifted it. But ultimately, I, I think playoff baseball is really what it's going to come down to the city moving forward. And I think that's just the state of the sport. The 21 run was special because obviously like so what I want to say about the Red Sox being able to like get back that uh, that popularity and to lose point about how loud it was. It's not just about winning because the 2011 Red Sox, they won a lot, uh, but people just didn't fucking like that team. It's it's not it's not just good enough to win. You also have to be likable. Like when Kyle Schwarber started going off, it was just like when he was hitting like grand slams in the playoffs. It's like there are a lot of pieces here from 18. We like these guys. Kevin Pulecki, you know, he's got the uh, uh, dancing on my own. Like we like that song. People love theme songs. People like themes to teams. Uh, yeah. And then you you mix in the element of just like guys that you like. It's sometimes it, which is kind of fucked up. Sometimes it's not enough to just win because it was also like post COVID where yeah. people were just looking for a reason to enjoy anything about life and like party <laughs> yeah. for any reason possible. Yes. And like, Oh, cool. We got a good baseball team. Nice. Yeah. Let's fucking get <laughs> fucked up. Yeah. But to yeah. Tyler's point, even though like it was fun for a while, but then the deadline and then they played like shit and mm-hmm. then it turned into, Oh, they're just going to choke. And then it gave people a reason to just rip them and shred them. And yeah. like Felder and Mass became the nail, put wanted. the nail in the coffin. Yeah. Put the nail in the coffin. You know, they didn't get what they wanted. Act like babies. And honestly, it happened overnight because if you remember, they lived into the playoffs. They're like, oh my God, they're not going to make the playoffs. And all of a sudden, you beat the Yankees in a wild card. It just freaking took off. Now, was it bogey? Three run bomb in the first? Like, that was yeah. it. Like, it, it, it happened overnight. And it was like one of the greatest two weeks or whatever it was, two and a half weeks of entertainment that I can remember at Fenway Park. I mean, that was just ridiculous. Yeah. I've talked to players on the 18 team. They were also on the 21 team. They all agreed that for that wild card game against the Yankees, there was no singular game, any moment throughout the entire 18 run that was as loud or even as close to as loud yeah, as the wild card game it. against the Yankees in 21. I believe it. And they played the Yankees. It's not like, oh, it's that's the Yankee element. They played the Yankees fucking twice at Fenway. Yeah. And they won one of the games. It's not even like they got blown out. So, oh, we didn't have the chance to get to get loud. Like, no, they they won one of the games at Fenway against New York. So I don't know. I don't know what it was. I mean, maybe to Pete's point, there is an element of like, hey, let's let's uh, let's go nuts because we've just been cooped up like that. You have to remember 21. They started that season with like what? Like uh, no fans. 20 percent. Yeah. Yeah. Something crazy like that. Um, But yeah, that, that's that's what's, I guess, discouraging for me is I felt that same thing where the 21 team was like, Hey, like let's build on this 2020 sucked, but it was a fake year. Now this is what this is. Uh, you know, all the, I don't want to say false promises, but all the promises that we were made by the front office, we're going to see some of that come to fruition and we're just getting started. Like we Mm -hmm. were ahead of schedule. We weren't even supposed to be in the ALCS. We got, we got two games from the world series. Like we're almost there. And then last year happens and it's it puts you in a spot where you're, you're having your doubts about the vision, which I asked you about the path. Uh, is there a plan? We had Matt Barnes on the last episode and he said, whatever it is, like they have a plan, like the, there is a plan. So whether or not it, it works is is something that remains to be seen. But rest assured, they do have a plan. Um, but I would just, I would love for, I just want, I just want watchable baseball, Lou. I know that you're, you're in the same boat. You just want to, you just want to have your baseball this summer. You want a team that you can sit down and watch and not want to fucking die by the sixth inning because it's like, here we go again. That's the last thing that I want is they are who we thought they were, or here we go again, or this is brutal. This becomes a chore. I just want to, I just want baseball that I can enjoy. That's it. That's all I want. Yeah, I want meaningful games in September. That's always, it's usually like the stock answer for me as far as like, what do you want out of the year? Give me meaningful games in September. Give me a shot. You know, now there are other teams that you look at like 18, you're like, screw meaningful games. You know, I mean, win the division, get to the World Series. But 
realistically, just give me meaningful games. You know, and and go. It's going to be ups and downs. They may have a great start, a bad May, whatever. This is one sixty two, right? It's just the way it is. Injuries. I mean, that's it. I think it's easy for people to look at this team and say they're going to win seventy games and they're all going to get hurt. Every single freaking one of them are going to get hurt. And it's almost like if you look at the other, if you look at the other side, say, what if they're healthy? Then you're just like a homer. You know, then you're just like a loser. You know, that you're just like paid by the Red Sox. If you happen to actually look at the optimistic side and wonder if they can stay healthy, right? So, um, I don't know. I'm, we started this whole thing, and I'm with you 100%. Like, the offseason is pretty much over. Maybe they add another piece or two. I don't know. It's wait and see. Get through camp healthy. First step. All right, that's the first step. And then get through April, you know, somewhat healthy. And just it's about health right now for these guys. Because if they're healthy, they can compete. That's it. It's if twenty one twenty if it's twenty twenty one where you can get lucky with health. That's it. Yeah. Can you keep a majority of the team right and you keep your head above water? This team's going to compete. That's the reality of it. Now, is it scary when you start thinking about how wild card spots are going to work in the American League? Sure, but it's one sixty two. A lot happens. Injuries will come. You know. You know. You got the Twins and you got the Mariners and obviously the other two. You know, one of these teams in the AL East is going to win the division. And you know, say it's the Yankees. You got the Rays and the Blue Jays, right? Like, there's a lot of conversation there, but. That was how a lot of people felt in 2021 as well. If you get off to a hot start, anything can kind of play in your way. You got a lot of veterans on this team. And I think the bright side is no matter what, last year, the vibes were so poor. And, you know, a lot of that was created by the front office and the trade deadline from the year before. And then the trade deadline this past season. Um, Kike Hernandez talked about it with Chris Rose the other day, emphasizing it over and over again. We needed some new you know, voices in the clubhouse. Justin Turner is probably, you know, the key to that ignition. Um, but okay. So this is a team. That's how we felt in 2021. The spirits were high. It felt like they were kind of coming out and revamped. It was kind of a new era of Boston Red Sox baseball. seems like they're trying to create that in 2023. Now, do you have the same kind of core pieces you had that you could depend on Xander? No, you, you lost that piece. JD Martinez at that time, obviously he produced, but you know, a lot of people thought JD was cooked after 2020. Uh, and they were like, you know, who you didn't know what JD Martinez was going to give you. I got called a homer for saying, I thought he was going to be productive. So it's like, yeah, you need certain things to click the right way here. But if you can kind of squint your eye, you can see this team winning, you know, 85, 88 games and you're in the conversation. You'll be playing meaningful mm-hmm. games second week of September, third week. And I'll take a veteran team that has something to prove because you saw the 2021 Red Sox were that in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. Lou, yes, sir. I, uh, I told you I was uh, I was going to try my best to keep it to two hours. I know people God. have been asking, when are you going to get Lou on? When's Lou yeah. coming on? And I was trying to wait. I was trying to wait for the season, but people people wouldn't let me wait. I was like, I'm save it for when more people are actually honed in on baseball. But I guess because you were demanded at such a high rate uh, in February, that's a good thing. When people care about baseball, when there's still snow on the ground, <clears throat> that's a good thing. So I'm happy to deliver Lou Merloni, Lou Merloni for the people. Um, but all this means is that you're going to have to make more frequent appearances during the season because technically for yeah. the s- second time, we're now coworkers. Okay. I'm in. But how often can I come on? You tell me and tonight when you, I asked you how long we could go, I said, I gotta get my kid up at six 45. So I don't, I gotta only go to about six 30. So I don't right. want to, you know, you go for like 12, 14 hours here, but. I'm in. You let me know. Okay? okay. I'll talk to my people. You talk to your people. We'll get our people together. We Let's work get our for the people same together. People. Yeah, we yeah, work, we for, the work for the people. same people. This is this yeah, is the second in. time, second time, second company that we uh, we're coworkers. And also, I mean, we're gonna be bringing back the streams again. So it's like you're oh, we're yeah. gonna get Lou on the couch, Lou at the bar. How talk to about- a lot. How excited were we to do this like stream thing at your house at that yeah. one game? Do you remember the game? They were down like nine nothing after the second inning. <laughs> That was the that was the Nate Evaldi five home run game, right? Yeah, yeah, in the first inning, right? And we're saying like, <laughs> yeah. all right, let's let's dive into this game. This is going to be a blast, and it's like a freaking firework show in the first. They're down nine nothing. They're like, all right, you got another beer? I mean, what are we going to do now? I don't know. <laughs> so how's your how's your love life? Like, what's you up to, Jared? Like, what's I mean, it was nothing. There was nothing to talk about. Like, this sucks. There was nothing to talk about for the game. No, for the game at least, yeah, but. I, the game was probably what, like three and a half, four hours, and we basically oh, yeah. just did, we just did a four-hour podcast. Basically, yeah. There no, was, was no dead air. There was no was, dead air. Was, like we just shot the fun. shit for four hours. Yeah, 
but I was expecting to maybe sit down and be like, ah, oh, you go they go to the pen and you're having discussions about like real life shit with the socks up like one. You know what I mean? And instead it's like fourteen nothing in the third. So I'm yeah. like, all right, whatever. We're yeah. good. You wanted some pizza? Yeah. So between yeah. between EEI and Nesson, you're yeah. gonna have to give me your schedule okay. for when you're not doing games. And then right. we'll be able to pick when can Lou come on the podcast. When can Lou do a stream at the Carabas compound? We, we got we to work with you. You're a busy man these days. Can we get that? Well, how quick before we get the cage going? Can we go up there? And, I mean, and apparently, cuts? apparently, like the, the, the pros of the pros are coming yeah. in here to do that. So uh, uh, it might I mean, be done by next week. Who knows? I got time. It's just beautiful. I got to like, work a week, maybe have a week off. You let me know. I'm in. I'm in. Done deal. In the meantime, done I'll, go, deal. I'll walk the dog for a little bit. I'll go hang out. Lou Merloni. What's the, is your, is your Twitter just Lou Merloni? That's it. <laughs> That's it. Follow That's him on it. Twitter if you don't Don't already. Know. At Lou Merloni. Uh, the content's been great recently. Congratulations on the Nesson gig. You deserve it and uh, you deserve Appreciate more games. Um, but I'm actually, for now, I'm, I'm, I'm excited that you don't have the full slate because that means that you get to come over and play. So we're going to go. be mixing Lou back into the mix. Um, Lou, it's been a pleasure. Go All to right, bed. Jared, always find, I'll always find time for you, of course, no matter what. Thanks, Appreciate boys. That. Thanks for having on me. It's a good time. Thank you. Buenas noches, amigos.